Hello, everybody. This is Ian McDonald from Sick Drummer Magazine. This is our first ever live feature interview um, with Mr. Dirk Verburen of Megadeth. Welcome. Thanks, <laughs> and, Ian. Uh, Thanks for having me. Absolutely. And also, we are joined uh, by John Longstreth of Origin and several other bands. And I could have said several other bands about Dirk as well. We, we, we get into that a little bit later. But uh, thank you all for joining us. Thank you. Ian. Um, it's good to keep it short. <laughs> I went through a little bit of a uh, phase this past week or two uh, with my background image here. Uh, you guys should obviously see Dave Colross on the top left and uh, Braun and Tim. And the reason I chose those guys is because basically 16 years ago, uh, that's where Sick Drummer started. Um, I grew up in the same town with these guys. We hung out, we played together, uh, gigged together, learned from each other. And this is also why I chose the Salako t-shirt, uh, representing again the hometown and guys who have gone on to do fabulous things within music and metal uh, globally. Um, so welcome to the first show. Uh, we're just going to go ahead and kick it right off here. I'm going to start off by saying uh, my condolences to uh, Dirk and his friends and family and past bandmates uh, who have recently suffered their loss with uh, Mr. David Anderson. So. Uh, our condolences, sir. Thank you. Yeah, I appreciate it. It's been a it's been a bit of a brutal year. Um, uh, I lost another former bandmate a few months ago, uh, Guillaume Bido from Scarf, my first band. Sadly, to similar reasons as as David Anderson addiction, and so you know, of course, it's heartbreaking. And I just hope that this highlights once again, you know, how devastating addiction can be and. For all those who know somebody who struggles, or if you struggle yourself, please get help and you know, please do what you need to do and reach out. It's it's really sad to see such talented people leave at such a young age. Yeah, uh, absolutely, absolutely, very nice. So, um, thank you for that. Let's just jump right in. We'll go back a little bit here and uh, have you maybe answer, uh, talk a little bit about the process of how you started to understand that Megadeth was looking for a replacement and what the process was like of you auditioning or getting into the band. Yeah, sounds great. Actually, it wasn't really an audition type situation. Um, I was on tour with Soilwork and uh, I received a call from Dave's manager. Kind of out of the blue, I was just in a hotel room and my phone rang and I didn't recognize the number and Hey, uh, Dave Mustaine would like to speak to you in the next few days if you'd be available. So I kind of like did a double take and, <laughs> you know, it's not the kind of phone call you ever expect to receive just, just like that. Uh, I spoke to Dave a couple of days later. He was very nice and he basically explained to me that they needed somebody to just step in for some gigs. Um, and, and, you know, if I would be willing to do that, of course, I said yes. Finished the tour with Soil Work, went home studied the set about i think it was about 18 songs that they asked me to learn and uh shortly after that i was in ohio doing a rehearsal with the band which went really smoothly and the next day was the first show which was rock on the range festival uh, in columbus and from there you know basically uh, about a week later or so dave said to me like so and are you telling the so we're guys are in my band now and i, I was i laughed and he was serious. <laughs> so luckily my wife, my wife had already kind of prepared me and said like, what are you going to do if he asks you to stay? You know, you should think about it because I didn't even in my mind, I was like, there's no way that's going to happen, but it did happen. And so um, the soil work guys were all very supportive and said, of course, you should do this. And, you know, this is a chance of a lifetime. Go for it. And, and here we are. <laughs> wow. That was... Um... You replaced, it was Glenn, Dr Sean Drover. Sean Drover, correct? Uh, he, he was already out of the band at that point. So they had done, um, the album Dystopia came out early 2016. And that was Chris Adler who played on that. But he was still in Lama God as well. And that's where I think everything became problematic. And initially I was just supposed to fill in when he couldn't do some dates. But then it ended up that, you know, Dave just wanted me to be in the band and yeah, basically said you're in the band now. Okay. <laughs> and congratulations. Yeah. Nope. Thank you. <laughs> <clears throat> 
So right now you're on uh, a tour and you have a night off. So thank you for taking the time on your night off to hang with us. Um, so the tour you're on now, are you still using the same setup where I saw you in Rochester a couple months back where you're like way up in the air on that massive riser? Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm on my big castle in the clouds up there. It's uh, <laughs> it's kind of cool because I have the best view you could have on stage of anybody. You know, I can see everything and it is kind of strange to be that far away from the rest of the band, but at the same time, it, it's a lot of fun. So I just got to pay attention not to break anything when I climb up and down the ladder, you know, especially at the end of the show, I have to run down and go to the front of the stage and I always have to remind myself, like, you know, don't, don't fall. <laughs> <Babe. laughs> <laughs> that is a really tall i'm sorry Ian. no no go go ahead how tall is that riser because that is a that is tall i'm just kind of i think it's about nine feet or eight feet something like that for some of the shows we have a giant vic rattlehead robot come from underneath it we're not doing that actually right. on this tour but on the previous one i think the one you saw you yeah. did yes yes so it needs to be able to accommodate uh a seven foot uh humanoid i guess i'll call <laughs> yeah <laughs> Yeah, that's awesome. So, yeah. Well, why don't you, could you walk us through uh, walk us through a typical day on on tour with Megadeth? And what you you know, just the whole day. Uh, well, I mean, it's it's pretty similar to what you would do. Like on any tour, we come in and um, get settled a little bit in the venue, and as soon as things are ready, we sound check. So in this case, since we're opening for Five Finger Death Punch, you know, they do their thing first. So we usually come in the venue a little bit later. But on most tours, like headlining tours, we'd, we'd come in like in the late morning and sound check in, around noon or early afternoon. Um, and then after that, usually we do a VIP meet and greet thing, which is, uh, you know, meeting with fans. We talk with them the way we do it now. We changed it a little bit because of COVID because we used to take pictures with every single person. but that became not not uh, a good thing to do, obviously, with, with uh, COVID being around. So we changed it to where now it's a Q&A. So people get to ask us some questions. Uh, we, we talk with them, with them all, you know, we, we, we tell some stories, make it a fun experience. After that, usually it's time to go get some food. And then it's the run up to the show. So um, we warm up, you know, we work out. Dave brings usually a trainer along. Currently, it's the last two tours. It's been his jiu-jitsu professor, a guy named Reggie Almeida, who's like a, a really uh, well-established uh, Brazilian jiu-jitsu uh, personality, a star in his field, you know, and so he's been on tour with us, and he helps us with whatever we want to do, whether it's jiu-jitsu or just regular fitness or anything. He, he knows it all. So staying fit is obviously an important part of being able to do such tours day in, day out. And then... And then it's warming up, and then it's the show, and that's it. Now, I know John's going to have some questions later about techniques and sticking and whatnot, but <laughs> how much time, in a general sense, do you spend each day warming up? Not particularly what you're warming up on, but how much time do you actually spend getting warmed up? I try to do at least a half hour, 45 minutes before each show. Um, sometimes it's more, sometimes it's less, but that seems to be kind of a good, a good average for me. Um, and we also jam. So Dave might come in and be like, hey, guys, let's let's play this and this song. We have a little setup, which is really cool. We, what we call the jam room. And so we can all kind of get together and have a little uh, Roland TD25 electronic kit. So we can, you know, if we want to learn a new song or just go through any song on the set that we feel we want to play or somebody wants to practice a part or review something, it's right there. We also have a computer that has all the stems. So, for example, if Kiko yeah. wants to be like, what was that solo in this song like again? You can go through the Dropbox folder. There's the solo to Dread and the Fugitive Mind. Just listen to the solo play along. So it's really well well set up for us to be able to perform at our best every night. If we do something wrong, like, it's really our fault. You know, <laughs> We can't blame it on anyone else. <laughs> yeah, right. So being that high up on the riser, I'm interested in how that would affect and I don't know who it is anymore. I know for a long time, Tony Lariano was the tech for Megadeth. Is he still your tech or no? Now, no, he was for a few years, but for he's not anymore. Okay. So you have a so different I'm, tech. I'm, I have, yeah, I have a guy now uh, named Ronnie Heis who worked with Joey Jordison for many years. Really great tech. Uh, he must be very tall then, because I'm wondering if something happens. Is he just climbing that ladder to you know fix a cymbal stand or, or, or yeah? 
Wow. Yeah, he is, man. He is. Yeah, he, he needs to stay fit too, because and he is very tall. He's taller than me, but he's like, you know, he's always keeping an eye out. And and sometimes he actually did a really great save the other day because I had one of those popping the rezo head on the snare moments, uh -huh. and and it happened shortly before like a 10 second break in a song, and he managed in 10 seconds he managed to swap my snare. It was like literally like as he put the snare on, like that was my first hit back, and he just nailed it. So yeah, that's a testament to how great he is. <laughs> so is he actually like got some feet on the ladder still and doing this, or is he on the riser with you? Is there enough room to him for him to stand behind you, type of thing, without falling off? <laughs> yeah, he, there's enough room. He he's on the ground, so but you know he'll he'll storm up there if he needs to, and I have the second snare that's ready for when that happens. So gotcha. so far we haven't had any major disasters yet. We'll see, you know. <laughs> <laughs> how it goes moving forward <laughs> all right um john you got anything else while we're talking about the uh the daily well yeah, kind of man i'm just like i'm kind of curious you know the, the, like the daily you know you said you get 35 to 45 minutes i love the fact that you guys or that dave at least gets to train that you guys have a a room where you all get to jam and work on parts like that i guess i'm just kind of curious like you've done both at this point now you've done the underground underground van tours you know and now you're doing these arena tours and i'm kind of curious you know like what do you what do you miss from the little tours you know and what do you not miss from them and all that kind of stuff like what's the big differences that like how refreshing is that that's got to be wonderful yeah it, it is refreshing it's it's just it's just everything kind of, you know, there's more people taking care of more things. So you can focus more on just putting down a good show in this case now, when we have a new album out doing press, things like that, you know, so there's less distractions. You don't have to worry so much about things like gear and, and, you know, if there's something wrong in the venue, we have people taking care of all that stuff. So we just show up, do our job, play, go to bed, you know, that's pretty much the thing. So it does take a lot of pressure off your shoulders. On the other hand, there's a real charm to club tours. It's a lot of fun to to just go and, you know, do the underground thing and kind of run your own show and, and all the charm that comes with things not being perfect, you know, the, the punk yeah. vibe. I, I grew up obviously doing that. I mean, that's, that's where pretty much we all start. And it has its charm. Um, you know, I don't miss the crappy, danky backstages and, the, <laughs> you know, venues where the one toilet is, is like broken in half because some guy decided to do a karate move on it the night before i don't miss that but <laughs> it's nice Tuesday to have a semblance of january you know, yeah yeah exactly exactly it's nice to have a semblance of civilized tour happening and, and they've always make sure that when it comes to all that we're, we're covered um That's but, cool. you know I'm, i wouldn't be against hopping in a van like you know i i'm, I'm a i'm a grindcore guy also and you know that's all about diy <laughs> yep, that's where uh, that's where me and my friends originally discovered you was, I think it was the Hematoba EP. Oh wow, yeah. yeah, yeah, and that was like, nice. who is this guy? And now <laughs> you were this kind of because we were just listening to the Hematoba EP all you know all the time, and it just seems like yesterday. And now you're in Megadeth, and yeah, that's it's mind blowing to watch a guy go from underground death metal to the very top. And that's just very, very cool to me. And yeah, Thanks, man, congratulations. Yeah. Thank so you. in Rochester, when I saw you, uh, <clears throat> when I saw you in Rochester, back to another thing about your dailies, uh, you had just gotten back from walking around near the venue and hit a record store and bought a few pieces of vinyl. Is that something that you do or you try to do in every city or? Yeah, I usually have to hold myself back or else, you know, I'll end up going home with three suitcases and all my mm -hmm. money spent before I even end the tour. So, you know, it's a it's a tricky thing buying vinyl. But <laughs> but yeah, I love it. You know, so I try to have like a few moments throughout the tour. where I, I allow myself to go explore and also just see the city. It's a cool thing. That's one thing that you don't necessarily get when you do club tours. A lot of times we would be kind of outside of where all the cool stuff is. With Megadeth, yeah. it's cool because we're a lot of times closer to the city center. I will also, on day, days off, stay in the city center usually. Um, a hotel great. that has kind of access to, to a lot of things around. So then it's fun to just, you know, do, do cultural things too. The other day in New York City, I, I went to the World Trade Center, which I hadn't seen the, 
the monuments, you know, since, mm-hmm. since that had happened, or I think I'd been there briefly, but I hadn't really had the time to take it, take it all in. So that was a kind of a heavy and, and, and uh, intense experience to, yeah, to see yeah. all that. And, but that's, that's the beautiful thing. You know, you, people always say, wow, you get to travel the world, you get to see the world. And I feel that that's a bit more of the case now that we actually have days off and we have better locations. So that's definitely one of the big privileges and plus sides to touring at, at this level. Yeah, okay. that's very cool. Yeah, I can see that being problematic if you're trying to take too many records back home all the time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I usually bring an extra bag with me, like a vinyl bag that's like folded inside my uh, suitcase. But when that one's starting to be too full and I'm like, okay, no more no more scanning, you know, Google Maps for what record stores are nearby or else it's going to be bad. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you just said vinyl bag, but I think you said vinyl bag. <laughs> Vinyl bag, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah Vinyl symbols, vinyl. yeah, best in the world. <laughs> well, well, sure. While we're talking about vinyl, um, why don't you tell us a little <laughs> bit about your current vinyl setup? Um, you know what uh, some of your favorites are, and and uh, talk about the durability, and you know a little bit about about your current setup. Absolutely, actually, durability is one of the main reasons why I love the vinyls. They seem to last longer than most other symbols i've played i don't know if that's just because i got more proficient at hitting a symbol the correct way as i became a more experienced drummer that might be a part of it too i don't know but mm-hmm. i just ever since i played minor i always felt like wow they just don't really break much at all you know even the smaller ones so that's that's really cool um some years ago i was invited to do a tour at the factory which is in a city called Gutenstetten in germany I don't know if you've ever been there, John. I know you you play Meinl too. Not yet, not yet. But I do uh, agree a hundred percent on how they don't break. Yeah, right. So, so and you're not the only uh, fellow Meinl and or C that I've talked to about this. So, so if you want durable symbols, they really are a great choice. I currently play mostly the Classics Custom Dark series, which are all my crashes, my secondary hi hat, and one of my chinas. And then the other series I blend in with that is the Bison's Brilliant Heavy Hammered, mm-hmm. formerly MB20. I used to play mostly MB20, but I actually do find that the Classics Custom Dark are, are a bit more adapted for stage because they're a bit less overpowering the crashes than the MB20s were. Um, yeah, so right. for me, it's a nice blend. You know. Um, Anyway, so when I got to visit the the factory and I found out Norbert Simon, who's one of the, the heads at Meinl, gave me a tour and explained to me that it's basically a zero waste facility, which being a very ecologically minded person just made me super stoked. You know, they recycle all their all the stuff they use. They also made a very conscious decision to stay in Germany when like everybody else, they got offered to go to China and save a bunch of money and just get your symbols made there like a lot of companies did you know or do they're like no we're going to stay in germany we're going to keep german employees we're a german company that's what we're going to do so i have a lot of respect for things like that too so um another reason to love my yes very cool i've seen you at a bunch of nams obviously we've known each other i don't know 14 15 years at this point have you ever attended a music mess over there in germany you know i never have no. Crazily enough, me either. <laughs> nope, heard a lot about it, but never been. Well, before I go I'm on, sure to it's some just more... as loud as Nam. <laughs> oh, sorry. Go ahead. I didn't hear. What I said, said I'm sure it's just before. as loud as Nam. <laughs> oh yeah, I've heard it's quite similar actually. Um, uh, before I go on to more of your gear, you brought something up there about your, you know, your personal uh, interests in recycling and other types of global friendly initiatives. And earlier today, I saw you had posted something about this shark water initiative. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Absolutely. Um, some years ago on the plane, I was flying somewhere for a tour. I, I don't remember where I watched this movie shark water, which I recommend to watch it's very moving it really touched me deeply because i had no idea that there was such a disaster going on for sharks they're basically getting massively killed off through overfishing and also because there's a great demand for shark fins with which they make shark fin soup so what they basically do is they just pick sharks out of the water cut their fins off and throw them in the water to die they die a slow agonizing death you know they're still alive when when all this happens obviously and you know, that's all fine and dandy where not that humans have now eliminated 90% of all sharks. 
And sharks are extremely necessary to the oceans because it's an ecosystem. It's a balance. If you take away the top predator, you're going to have invasive species such as yeah. giant jellyfish, for example, that are already taking over certain areas of the oceans because there's no more sharks to keep things the way it should be. So um, anyway, so, uh, you know, I, I share a lot of stuff on my Instagram here and there. I do stories about animal related causes, all kinds of them. And, and so uh, not too long ago, the Sharkwater Foundation saw one of my posts where I tagged them and they reached out. They said, do you want to be an ambassador? We're doing a, 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 an initiative called Shark Free, hashtag Shark Free, which is because shark products are also being used for things like shampoo and and hair conditioner and things like that, which, you know, it doesn't specify on there, this contains shark, but really like fish products or something. A lot of that, you know, leftover waste goes there, right? So who needs shark in their shampoo? Like, not me. You know, I don't think that's really good or necessary for anything. So so I was like, yeah, sure, I'll sign on. And um, so there we are. You know, I, I try to, I think one of the really important things for me being in the position that I am is to use it to do what I believe is something good, you know, make a difference because it's fine and dandy. I love being, you know, doing the music I do, but um, if I don't use my platform to hopefully bring about some positive change in the world, then I would feel like I'm really wasting an opportunity. You know, I, I think uh, people look up to people like myself and, and Dave and, you know, Dave has done a lot of things too. Like he, he has some soup kitchens in Hawaii, in, in, uh, in Haiti that he's co-sponsored. And I also have another, um, NGO that I started recently called Savage Lands, which is about reforesting in Costa Rica. I'm, I'm heavily involved with that. So, yeah, you know, I think it's only normal for a person like myself who cares about those things to share my concerns with my fans. And hopefully some people will realize that you don't have to, you know, dedicate your entire life to this. You can just kind of research understand what's going on, maybe donate a little bit of money here and there or just do something local like a person reached out to me and said, "Oh, I, I bought a little parcel of land behind my house, and I'm I'm built I'm planting trees there to help reforest." And I'm like, "That's wonderful! You know, if you can do something like that, great, do it!" Like, it's we all have to step in and make little changes in order for the world to be a better place. That's what I believe. Now, if I'm not mistaken, you and your wife have a podcast. Do you still do the podcast? And if it was based on this type of initiatives and it, you know uh, when this interview is over i will gladly put the shark initiatives links in the description on the youtube video and any other links you would like and if you still are doing your podcast uh, let me know and i will obviously link that as well and where people can check that out thank you that's awesome yeah the, the thing we do is more radio show it's on gimme metal which i don't yep. know if anybody here is familiar with that station yep. but so we have yep. our show on there that's more just purely music based um we do it on and off. We do it kind of when we're available and <laughs> when we find time because it takes a lot of time and work to put together the playlist and do the show. So right now it's it's too busy for both of us, but we'll be back on there for sure. And thank you, Ian, for helping spread the word. I really appreciate that. Oh, it's my pleasure. It's my pleasure. Like you said, if everybody does just a little bit, we would have uh, a lot less of a you know uh, massive problem and more of a manageable problem. So. Yep. Anything, like you said, anyone can do. I'm down for it. So, um, yes, let's let's move on to uh, let's talk about Tama Drums. And if you don't mind, we'll just take a quick couple seconds here and see a, a little preview uh, that Tama sent us over for for this interview. We'll be right back in about fifteen. I remember, yeah. I remember that show. I believe the second half of that f fifteen seconds, um, I believe, was in Denver. Yes, I, I exactly. Knew. Awesome. I so was on one of my first tours with the band. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I believe it was. It was, and that was. Uh, I believe that was Lily that came out and filmed that <laughs> for us. Awesome, Lily yes. Gruber. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> nice relate, different Lily, but. You know, it's cool. <laughs> I feel so, dumb. <laughs> no, let's go ahead and uh, no, it's fine. Tama drums, take it away, Dirk. What? Tama drums. Well, you know, 
for me, the best stuff. Uh, I've actually been with them for a long time. One of my teachers, when I went to music school right after high school, worked for Tama in France. He was he was a part of the distribution company, and so he hooked me up with kind of like a beginner's endorsement type deal. Um, you know, fifty percent off a double pedal or something like that. And from there, over time, as I was doing more stuff, it evolved into a real endorsement, and I got to know the way Tama operates, which is really cool because um, they have this, they kind of strive for perfection before they put anything out. Over the years, I've been able to help test things. For example, the new Dynasync pedals, which are their first direct drive pedal, those have been in development for years before they were released, I believe, last year or the year before. And uh, so they invited me and a bunch of other drummers to come try prototypes. And the first prototype was shit pretty much. You know, I mean, they'd never built a, a direct drive pedal. And so it, it was like, it's supposed to be faster and easier than a chain pedal. And it was the opposite. So I think they got a lot of crappy feedback on that one. And then, you know, the next prototype was better and so on. So I went and tested diff different times. And in the end, it's a fantastic pedal and I'm using it now. So I like to see the how involved they are with that kind of stuff and how much they care about really putting out something when it's ready not just because like oh hey there's a market for a direct drive let's just throw something out there they really care about what they do and on top of that of course you know the the, the drums themselves sound amazing i mean i've always loved tama has a very recognizable sound and uh you know it, they've always been kind of part of the metal scene i mean nick menza played tama so it's it's kind of nice to continue that you know the old school tradition in that way yeah you have you're among a, a fantastic roster of uh killer drummers uh on tama <laughs> absolutely and i love their booth yeah. at nam too i mean when nam was nam um <laughs> it was one of my favorite booths to go and check out and you know take pictures and, and hang out they're all great people too that you know your guy jim gallagher yes. fantastic guy um yeah so cool um yeah let me ask you this um is, is since you've been playing tama what has been your most you said not the heads but um you said you broke through a rezo head the other day and that's one thing that's but what, what's been the most reliable piece of gear as far as you've used from tama was would it be a pedal would it be a drum would it be the hardware um what let's see what's your favorite thing they build i mean you know the drums for the sound because they just have a unique sound and they're 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 really well crafted like i've never had a bad tama drum you know you know how sometimes you buy a kit and then one of the toms is a bit off i've, I've never had that issue with tama because i think their quality control is just extremely high and yeah the hardware i love too um especially the newer star series which is their high-end series is, is amazing like the snare stand that they have now a newer model it's just incredible. It's super flexible. You can go really low, which I like, because I like to have my snare like in the basement, as people will jokingly say. And uh, and and it's just very easy. And instead of having the thing where you have to rotate a knob to loosen the arms, there's just basically one um, one. Uh, I can't find the word. One thing that loosens loosens the front arm, and you can slide that down. And so it's easier to pop off the snare. It's quicker. Um, yeah, yeah, but yeah, yeah, yeah just, just like, like quick release. Yeah, just the overall, yeah. exactly, quick release. Yeah, yeah. So the overall quality of Tama products is just top notch. You know, I know they're not the only ones. I'm not saying they are, but for me, it's it's been it's been a fun journey working with them and and getting to know how they work and just yeah, they're, they're you know, it's also one of the advantages being with a big company when when you tour all across the world is that they can always arrange something. I've been to countries yeah. where. There is no Tama distribution, but they still managed to get me a kit there somehow, you know. Sometimes, like, I remember going to Russia with Slowwork back in 2008, and they just had one of their indoor Cs there, like, brought his kit for me to play on. <laughs> Which wow. I was like, oh, That's thank nice. you so much. That's amazing. You know, we had, like, a brand new kit, whatever. and You know, but we play in places like with, with Megadeth. We played, like, in the Philippines, for example. And, like, go get a Tama kit there, you know, good luck. <laughs> and they managed somehow. No, that's wild. I'm sure that's hugely helpful. Yeah. You know, like you know, mm -hmm. going from the days of the van tours, like John was talking about earlier, and you show up somewhere if you didn't have your own backline, and you walk in, and there's like just something in the corner that doesn't look like a drum set, but it kind of is, and you're supposed to play on it and perform. But you don't have that problem with yeah. with their with their global reach. Um, <laughs> that's got to exactly. be really. Yeah. I mean, usually we also 
we bring our own stuff now with Megadeth, you know, which is also, sure. uh, of course, a huge privilege. I, I never really did that much before. I mean, for some solo work tours, we could do it, but you know, a lot of times it was the typical thing where you play on whatever's there, or if you're opening, you play on the headliners kit, whatever. So, but uh, but now we we bring our own stuff, but there's still times when Tama needs to jump in and help. So bringing your own stuff, that reminds me of another question that kind of goes back a little bit in the interview, but that's okay. There are no rules here. Uh, how many, how many like tractor trailers or trucks, if you will, are on a typical Megadeth run with you with this elaborate stage and how many crew? Uh, yeah, I think, I think right now we have two tractor trailers and we have two buses because we do the band bus and then the crew bus. So right. on the band bus, there's, just us and our tour manager and um, uh, uh, Dave's trainer, and then sometimes we have a you know on parts of the tour we have a, a cameraman too. We'll like do all the live footage you see and all the pictures and all that, and then uh, the crew bus for all the other guys. And you know, two, two tractor trailers is not that huge. I mean, some bands bring like ten. You know, like when yeah. we were on tour with Scorpions, they had like just a massive fleet of things. <laughs> they had a huge stage. But I think uh, I think it's gonna grow too, though, because we have some plans for expanding it when we get to to headlining for this album next year or, or in twenty twenty four. So, yeah, it might grow. <laughs> I saw a tool up in Toronto, or uh, not Toronto, London, Ontario, probably about six years ago, and they had twelve, and a, I believe they traveled wow. with close to a hundred people. Yeah, yeah could be yeah. wrong, but that's insane. It's insane. Mm -hmm. it can now, yeah, it, it can become a big undertaking to put on one of those massive shows. So much goes into it, you know, and, and so many people work like their asses off, especially those crew people, which we rely on so much. You know, they don't get enough credit. I mean, they're the first ones to get to the venue that have to set everything up in record time. And then they have to wait all the way until we were off the stage to start breaking everything down. And then they still have to get to the, the next place, you know. So those guys usually get like the least sleep and have the most physical work to do, which is incredible. And so post. what time? I'm sorry. What time do you guys get to the venue to to start the production? I've always been kind of oh early. Like, like our crew, like even now, our crews usually leave like at eight thirty in the morning. You know, when wow. when we're on on an off day in the hotel. So <clears throat> yeah, they leave super early, and um, it could be even earlier than that when it's a headlining tour. So mm. it really depends kind of on the situations. But yeah, those guys don't get a whole lot of sleep. You know, oh, which is also why it's good to have days off where they can just crash out and kind of catch up a little bit. Because if you did that like day in day out, they wouldn't last. You know, nobody would. Man, with everybody who you know does this for a living and who suffered in venues, bands alike, the venues closed, bands did not work for a long time with the COVID, and now you've got two tractor trailers and some of them have, you know, like we said, Scorpions ten, Tool twelve. The gas prices are not your friend these days, trying to make up lost income from not touring for that time. And now you're slapped with the increase of the fuel. And it's got to be quite hard for bands in general, small or large, to uh, to recoup and, and, you know, get back to where they once were. It's yep. crazy. I'm glad you're out there. Yeah, doing absolutely. It, <laughs> I mean, we're lucky to be able to. We were actually able to do a tour during the pandemic. You know, we did the metal tour of the year with Lamb of God and 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 Trivium and Hatebreed in 2021, which at that time there weren't many bands touring, and you know, I wasn't quite sure. None of us were quite sure how that was gonna go, but it was pretty massive because everybody was like, "Fuck yeah, a metal show! Like the first one in a year and a half, I'm gonna go." So all the shows were sold out. And it was kind of weird because we had to tour in a complete bubble. You know, we didn't even hang out with like the Lamb of God guys or anything like that. It was like yeah. masks and testing every day and just being super safe. And then James and I still got COVID at the end of it. So luckily it was like we got it as we were flying home. So, <laughs> you know, we didn't have to cancel any dates or anything like that. But yeah, it was pretty much bound to happen. Um, yeah, then the whole but yeah. thing <laughs> Right. Everybody. Yeah, it's, 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 I think everybody's had it at this point. It's been an it's interesting long. time, you know. Yeah. I'm going to go backwards here for a minute again. I apologize because uh, Jet, um, you know, Gene Thomas, huge fan of yours. And when we were talking about your podcast, she made – I'm watching the YouTube comments here on the side. I'm just going to go ahead and, and feature feature that <laughs> because mm -hmm. she yeah. says your shows are great. And I just wanted to show that because I've heard the same. I, I'll be honest with you. I, I haven't seen the show or heard the show, but – I, I believe uh, I believe DJ Jet's correct when she says they're great because 
pretty much everything you do is great, Dirk. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, thank you. <laughs> You're too kind. I just I'm, I'm passionate about all this stuff, man, and you know I've always been of the the mindset that if I'm gonna do something, I'm gonna give it my all, or if not, just don't do it. So that's kind of my uh, my motto in life. That's a good motto. It's a very good motto. So uh, let's go back to some more gear. Uh, let's talk about your heads after the. Uh, w- w- we won't mention the Rezo blowout again, but um, let's go ahead and uh, take a quick look at uh, what. Talk about some of the uh, different heads that you're playing, and uh, I'm going to go ahead right now and take a another 15 second break, and we're going to hear a few words from from Evans. We'll be right back. The most technically advanced drummers in the world require the most technologically advanced drumheads. Bit of a no-brainer when you think about it. In any case, we're more than happy to oblige. Pretty cool little feature there. I was happy. Tell them thank you very much. So, yes. what's uh, current head situation? How, how are we looking on that? Um, so Evans, they came up with this really cool innovation a, a few years ago. Um, they called it Level 360. It has to do with how far the heads go around the hoops of the drums. So for, for those of you who don't know, maybe you aren't familiar, you know, when you place a uh, drum head on a drum, whether it's a snare or a tom or a bass drum, anything, um, you have a hoop that kind of where it kind of rests on the, the head rests on the drum, on the edge of the drum. And so... They somehow found out that when you make those edges a bit longer, the heads are way easier to stay in tune and to tune as well. Uh, kind of an incredible innovation and, and incredible that it took so many years for somebody to come up with that. But the first time I tried it, I was blown away because you can basically just throw those heads on, you can make a few quick spins with the keys, and they're going to sound decent. Now, of course, yeah. if you want to really have a perfect sound, you still have to fine tune them. That's always going to be a part of it. But in situations where you have to be quick, or you don't necessarily have, you know, the tools or the time to, to sit there and, and fine tune it, you're still going to be okay with these heads. So that's one of the really cool things. Other than that, they're just great. They sound great. They're durable. Um, again, you know, just same thing as with, with, with the cymbals and with everything. You Drums are an expensive instrument. So if you can find something that can hold up the beating, whether it's in the studio or on stage, it's nice. You know, I try to not change my heads all too often. I mean, we still change them every few shows because it's kind of, you know, customary to do that. But at home, I keep my heads on for a long time. You know, sometimes I play on heads that are, you know, a year old. If, if it still sounds good, I'll talk to my producer. And if he's like, yeah, still sounds good, keep it on there. You know, and I'll keep it on there. I have no problem with that. Um, and um, so I, I, I switched a little bit between G2s and uh, EC2s for the toms. So it depends on, you know, usually in studio I'll do G2 because they have a bit more warmth. The EC2s are really great for live recordings and I mean for live shows and, you know, they're a bit more thick and a bit more durable in that sense. And then um, on the snare, I've been using the SD dry a lot. Works really nicely with the, I have the signature bronze Tama snare and it just sounds great with SD dry. And uh, EQ3 on the kicks, so yeah. That's pretty much my setup when it comes to Evans. Excellent. Evans is wonderful, man. I use G2s and heavyweight on the snare. I don't ever nice. change it. Just every time I rehead, it's just that. You know, probably right. until, until, a day, until a day I'm done playing drums. I can't imagine. So. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, that's the thing. When you find what works for you, there's no reason to, to change it around, you know. I mean, I like trying stuff out sometimes, but at the same time, I'm also a, a creature of habit, kind of like you, I guess. So, you know, if I find something that feels comfortable, I'm like, let's do it. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, why not? Why not? Speaking of comfortable, um, you're also – how long have you been working with uh, Vratum? It hasn't been that long, actually. Um, it's um, uh, Yoka, the drummer for Amon Amarth, uh, hit me up, uh, or, or, or rather put me in touch with them because I had been working with a company called DB Drum Shoes for many years, but they stopped producing. And yes. So I happened to talk to Yoka about that, and he said, hey, I'll put you in touch with Vaden. That's what I use. They're great. And that's probably about, I think it's about three years ago or four years ago. And so, yeah, they're great, man. I, I actually recently ran a little... Uh, I was curious to, to see what other drummers do because you usually don't talk that much about shoes, right? I don't know if you have that conversation, John, with 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 fellow drummers, but you know, yeah, 
I, I had uh, that conversation a few times. Yeah, yeah. So I guess some people talk about it, but I, I was just curious to see on, on my socials like what people thought. And to my surprise, almost nobody that played drums like uses drum shoes. They all either play barefoot or in their socks or use you know, some kind of tennis shoes or running shoes or whatever. So I thought that was kind of interesting because I was like, this is an athletic thing. And it's kind of like being a track runner and just, oh, I just run barefoot, you know, <laughs> whatever. It's like, wait, don't you want like a specialized product to do what you do? You know, so so I've been talking with Vredim about kind of upping the, you know, the awareness about that and putting together some kind of campaign where we can show people and drummers what the advantages are of having shoes that are especially made for for drummers that have you know the right kind of soles and the right kind of uh you know fabric like breathable fabric etc and yeah, in the yeah. end still people are going to use what, what they're comfortable with and what they want to use you know that's totally fine but i do think there's there's something to be gained when you try those shoes out yeah the flexibility and the breathability like you said so you're not you know in a van or a bus, you know, you take them off and you throw them in the, in the, in the corner and everyone's like, open the window. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I remember, exactly. you know, D DB was doing quite a bit with uh, metal drummers. I remember off the top of my head, only a couple like uh, Adam Jarvis and Darren Seska, you know, they were playing DB yep. for a while. Um, I was using those DBs for a mm -hmm. minute. Yeah. Yeah. They were pretty popular. Mm -hmm. I discovered yep. that, uh, you know, the, the, the funny thing about drum shoes and, the, the thing because i've talked to a lot of guys about drum shoes i've never used an actual pair of drum shoes except for the dbs i usually just have a pair of sneakers that i designate to the drums so i'm not walking around the streets of wherever and then i go and i get whatever local dog poop on my pedals um <laughs> but drummers you have to spray your drum shoes with some lysol because you'll end up in the hospital and uh that's all i'm gonna say there but Please spray your drum shoes with Lysol. Yes. <laughs> I, I second that. Absolutely. <laughs> okay. Well, while we're on clothing, uh, you, also, you also work with a couple clothing companies, one being Warren Star uh, and one being Rebellion. Um, why don't we go ahead and just tell me a little bit about Warren Star and what they've done with you and for you and how you like their stuff. Warren Star, they make the greatest jeans. You know, their, their jeans are just super good for for anything like i don't even just use them on stage i wear them i wear them on tour too they're just great they're perfect black jeans they have different kinds of cool kind of rock and roll models you know the shirts it's less kind of my thing because it, it leans a little bit more to the affliction style i mean they do have some cool ones but it, it's less my taste in that mm -hmm. case I, I usually wear band shirts or whatnot that's kind of what i grew up wearing but but the, the it's just really good quality stuff you know and, and i love the i love the pants especially so so yeah, they've been they've been uh, sending us a uh, good amounts of stuff over the years, and uh, yeah, they're a little company from Chicago, so you can check them out if you like. And Rebellion Republic is actually uh, my brother-in-law's company. So yeah, there you go. Thanks, Ian. Yeah, they have a they do merch for a ton of bands, and uh, they're just a really cool company. Uh, you know, I'm not just saying that because it's my brother-in-law. Is is just I know that they make quality stuff and that they care about what they do and. He's been in the business for a really, really long time, him and his wife. And so you know, I'm, I'm proud to be a part of their roster with Cadaver and Ben C. And, you know, I support them wherever I can. It was funny a minute ago. You said, we're going to talk about this towards the end of the interview, but I have to say it because it was funny in my head. And uh, that doesn't necessarily mean it's funny to anybody else. But uh, when you said, you know, when you were a kid growing up, all you wore was band shirts. And here you are wearing that Megadeth shirt and probably grew uh, grew up wearing a lot of different Megadeth shirts. And to me, that is just priceless, man. But we'll, we'll get into that a little more later, but that was funny. Um, so yeah. what about, uh, what about John Harvey audio? What, what, uh, what kind of, um, what kind of gear are you utilizing from, from uh, Jerry Harvey? I'm sorry. I said, John, but I meant Jerry. Yeah. Well, they, they make some really high end, uh, in your monitors. And, um, so with Megadeth, we have the luxury of bringing our own, monitor tech and monitor desk on tour which really makes a big difference when it comes to having it just a steady good sound on tour you know as as we all know from doing underground tours john ian you all know this a lot of times their stage sound can be determined whether whether you have a good night or not you know 
you can be all yes. pumped and stoked and be like ready to go and then you start playing and you can't hear a thing and it's horrible and you know then you just gotta kind of struggle through it because there's not much you can do and the guy at the monitor desk is like smoking doobies and not really caring about what's going on you know it's his it's his fifth show that week and he just doesn't like death metal and like he couldn't be bothered you know so yeah so we've we've all been there <laughs> sounds fun <laughs> yeah but so the, the, the Jerry Harvey audio is just really high end, you know, in your in your monitors and, and we all use like most of the band now as as the Jerry Harveys and I used to use the sure ones before that, which are more affordable for the everyday person. Like I wouldn't probably buy a pair of Jerry Harveys myself if I have to pay for them, but they're really high end. I think ours have like twelve speakers in each ear or something like that. I mean it's it's pretty crazy. Wow, so you get a really a clear, like almost studio like sound in your ears, you know. Again, if we mess up, if I mess up, like it's like 100% my fault. I can only blame myself because all the conditions are like so perfect. Like, you know. <laughs> yeah, Jeremy Kling was yeah. talking about those last night when we were on here just uh, doing a run through. And I've got a pair of uh, Ultimate Ears, UE18 Plus is uh, CSX. And yeah, they've got six, six in each ear, six drivers. And mm -hmm. I can't imagine having any more than that. That's crazy. <laughs> it's got to be incredible. Yeah, yeah. It's it's high level stuff, you know, but uh, again, you know, just fortunate to be able to use products like that. And, and, you know, I'm just thankful really, because it's like being able to play in those conditions is more than, more than I would have ever dreamed. You know, like I was used with solo rig to battling my way through whatever. There were even times when I just didn't have monitors because we had a keyboard player. And I remember playing some stages where I was like, well, either he has a monitor or I do, and he has keyboard. So if he has no monitor, he literally can't play. So, yep, you have them, and I'll just pretend that I hear what's happening, you know. <laughs> do, you, uh, do you use them for mixing at home as well? Uh, no, at home I usually use, I, I have a pair of, um, uh, gosh, what are they? I forget the brand now. That's all right. I'll have to look that I, up. But, yeah, I use a pair of regular headphones at home for, you know, when I do recordings on my, uh, on my e-kit or whatever. Well, here's another little. Sennheiser. Thank you. Sennheiser, yeah, yeah. Excellent. Yeah, they make great headphones. Yeah. Um, yes. This is excellent. I'm, this was not planned. I'm just going to do this because uh, there's a person here on YouTube watching this interview. You don't know him, but you know his father. And he didn't know that about the Rebellion Republic being uh, a relative of yours. So I'm just going to feature this on screen. And we can all say hello to uh, Dave Colross Jr. He's hey, there, Dave. Uh, interacting. I, I've known him through his father since he was about two. Uh, but recently we got to meet for the first time when he came up here to see Suffocation play in Rochester. And we've been talking ever since. And uh, he's a great kid. And uh, I just wanted to bring him on screen and uh, say hello, Dave. Thanks for joining us. We're going to get your dad on one of these pretty soon. <laughs> Dave Coros, awesome. <laughs> first death metal drummer I ever watched in person. I wow. remember that they wow. came with, yeah, they came through with Malevolent Creation, and I just walked straight up to him and I and I said, "Are you Dave Coros's tech?" And he goes, "No, I'm Dave." And I was just like, "Oh, can you show me a blast beat?" And he did for a couple of seconds, and and I was just awkward, and so I then I just sat on the side of the stage and just watched him go, and that was uh, when Malevolent was out doing the soulless i think it was so no not soulless nice. <laughs> eternal eternal sorry eternal yeah yeah, yeah yep. exactly yeah oh that was such a, such a great record I, I love that one quick story about your pop yeah yeah right yeah, up here yeah. right actually up well for you guys yeah. whatever yeah. that's actually uh that's a hand that's a hand-drawn painting actually yep. uh my boss did of dave um i've known dave since i was 19 18 and now his son's 19 so it was kind of full circle when he walked into the venue to see suffocation and i was standing there you know with eric burke from Salako lethargy you know brutal truth nuclear assault on and on and on and we got to take a picture you know together and it was just like wow here we are we've we used to hang out with your dad when we were your age and now here you are at this age it was anyway enough of a segue dave thanks for joining us man um you That's mentioned awesome. sure. You mentioned sure a few minutes ago. Why don't you uh, go ahead and tell me a little about what you are currently still using from sure? 
Yeah, um, they, they actually sent me a pair of kick microphones uh, some years ago, which I still have in my kicks to this day in the studio. They're just amazingly awesome. And um, uh, I forget the, the model number of them, but they're like the flat kick mics, which we've all seen, you know. They're just really great. My, my producer, Adair Daufenbach, he, he loves them too. And so um, that, they actually work together with the band in general. So we used a lot of sure stuff in the studio and on stage or, you know, whatever is needed. I mean, they're they're a very reliable brand. Obviously, they've been around forever. Everybody knows Sure. Um, so again, you know, just grateful to be able to to use some gear like that. Excellent. Well, while we're on electronics, let's just go ahead and just finish this out with the gear and talk about Roland. Yeah, Roland. <laughs> so I mentioned earlier that we have a little jam room with Megadeth that we we set up, you know, wherever we can. And uh, so for me, that's the Roland TD25, which is like a, a small electronic kit, but really good quality stuff. Uh, it allows us to prepare for the shows, practice whatever we need to do, and, and, and in decent conditions. Like if the guys come, Dave and Kiko and James, and they plug in on their mini amplifiers that they have, we can all still hear each other, you know, and it's very easy to adjust to get to find the right sounds and the right frequencies for because it changes obviously from day to day, from room to room. So you, you want to have something that's flexible. And this definitely is. And, and at home, I have a, a bigger kit, a TD50, which I've done a lot of recordings with. Uh, just awesome. Coupled with, you know, we'll talk about tune track, but coupled with that is just a, a machine of war. And I've actually recorded albums where, you know, even the people I was recording them for thought I used acoustic drums. And I said, no, that's. Uh, that's electronic drums with tune track samples, and they're like, "You're kidding me, right?" I'm like, "No, <laughs> that's how that's how good they sound nowadays." That you know, it's it's hard to tell the difference sometimes when it's properly mixed. It's hard to tell the difference. But I'm not sure which way to go now because I've got a couple of different points I want to take out of that, but yeah. I know I want to talk about one of them later. Uh, and I know you've worked on a couple of different projects with tune tracks, so. Is there anything else right now that you've got in the works with Tune Track or or not? And uh, what can you what can you say about working with that company to put out the kits or uh, the, the sample kits that you've already done? Sample packs. Well, uh, so far, yeah, I, I've mostly done drum MIDI for them, so it's still a mm -hmm. dream of mine to sample my actual drum kit. You know, so that's hopefully something we're going to be able to do this coming year. Just take the Megadeth kit that I use on stage and in the studio that I used for the album and, and sample that whole thing. That would be great. Plus some additional stuff, which, which is always part of the process, you know, extra snare drums and cymbals and whatnot. I would love to do that. So far, I've basically done a lot of MIDI. I came up with this idea after working with them for the first time on the Metal Foundry back in, I think it was 2010. Um, you know, Frederick from Meshuggah, who's one of the founders of Toontrack, had reached out and he said, you got to do something for us, record some MIDI. And so I went and I was kind of new to the process. So I didn't really know how it worked. But when I when I was doing that, I thought it would be really cool to do this in an organized way where um, people who want to use the MIDI to, you know, make demos or recordings or whatever they want to use it for can easily find what they want and especially extreme stuff because things like blast beats and fast fills uh, are hard to program and make make them sound realistic you know so i was like if i play them on the e-kit and i sort it all in tempos and in styles and in different types of blast beats and fills etc thrash beats whatever you know it might make it might make people's life a little bit easier when they look for this stuff you know instead of having to sit there and like program all the 16th notes and then end up with a thing that sounds like a, you know, a typewriter or something like that. So that's where the, where the MIDI pack idea came from. The library of the extreme it's called, I should say. Yeah. Well, it was very popular. Um, congrats on that. And I'm sure there'll be more collaborations in the future. I can't yeah, see whether I hope so. I can't I see hope whether so. it I mean, wouldn't be. Yeah. Two track is just great stuff. Like, like, yeah, go ahead, John. Go ahead. That exists for guitar players as well, right? Are there like, midi packs for guitar as well you know i'm not sure i know they did easy bass recently like in the last years they did that for guitar i think it's hard to do because just the nature of a the mm -hmm. sound of a guitar it's hard for it to not sound sampled so right i think people are still using guitar pro a lot you know and i get demos uh, first thing sometimes to record it's still a lot of like uh, 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 sounding like california games on the on the Amiga, you know, back in the day. <laughs> the Amiga, wow. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> Remember that oh, thing? <laughs> man, ow. 
That's awesome. <laughs> I've I got do. one <laughs> one more one more segue here. I don't know why I'm saying segue so much. Um, you mentioned a few minutes ago the rolling kits that you've been playing on different versions, and it's amazing how much they sound like you know real drums and whatnot. And last night we were talking to Jeremy Kling of the Absence and Venom Inc. and uh, in Human Condition front of house guy i mean super 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 guy and he's also in a new project with you called kill division with gus rio now jeremy's playing bass right and gus yep. is on guitar gus rio's on guitar and kyle simons is on vocals who some may know from his time with hate plow and when i heard the record forget the fact if it was real drums or not first of all it was some of the craziest drumming I think I've ever heard you do. So if anyone hasn't heard the new Kill Division yet, you're going to hear something from Dirk that you haven't heard before. So go buy it and check it out. And I also have to say that the band is just awesome, and Kyle blew me away. So why don't you tell me a little about the experience of coming together and how you recorded that album? Yeah, yeah. Um, so Gus and Kyle have been friends for many years. I think they had a band called Sickness together like some 30 years ago, and um, I didn't know Cal personally. I, I knew of him, but I'd never met him. But Gus had this idea. He wanted to do like a, a, a terrorizer style grindcore album, basically old Napalm Death, you know, just Jesse Pintado style riffs. And he's like, mm -hmm. that's really lacking in nowadays grindcore scene. You know, mm -hmm. that sound isn't really around anymore. I, I'm going to pick up the guitar, write some songs, and you guys let me know what you think. So he introduced me to Cal. I started sending us demos. And we were both like, man, this is this ghouls. Like, you're on it. And yeah, that's how the album happened. You know, he just hammered out songs, Gus did, and I put drums on him whenever I had time. And and uh, yeah, now we have the record, which is called, uh, what is it called again? <laughs> Damn, I forget. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Anyway, it's out on Redefining Darkness. And yeah, it's basically 34 minutes of old school grindcore. We even did a cover of a Terrorizer song. And as we were looking at that, we were all, submitting covers and i was like i really want to do something to, by terrorizer but everybody's already covered so many songs off of world downfall so i went and, and listened back to their old demos and i found this song uh that they basically had never properly re-recorded again to my knowledge you know at least i couldn't find those riffs in any other song so so we did that track which is kind of like an unreleased you know never properly recorded other than like a, 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 a rehearsal sounding version and we actually reached out to Oscar Garcia uh, through Leon Del Muerte, who's a friend of mine. Uh, they play in Terrorizer LA, like the LA version of Terrorizer, because now you have two Terrorizers, the one with Pete Sandoval and then the one with Oscar Garcia, who are both in the original band. And uh, we were trying to see if Oscar could uh, find the lyrics to this track. So he tried and went through his old you know, lyric folders or whatever. And uh, thanks, Cal. <laughs> Cal's in the chat here. That's awesome. And, uh, and yeah, he, yeah, <laughs> you were a monster too, dude. Seriously, we were just saying that, right, Ian? Yeah, but yeah, um, uh, so he, he couldn't find the lyrics, so he said, just write your own version. And so I think Kyle did a really brilliant interpretation, kind of keeping Oscar's lyrical phrasing style and the title of the song, and then just kind of giving his own version of that. So I'm, I'm yeah. super proud of how that turned out, it's pretty fun, yeah, and so. You, you know, can go grab sorry, that go on ahead. Bandcamp. No, just I just wanted to say you can go grab that on Bandcamp, by the way. And if I'm not mistaken, I'm not, I got like four windows open, but I believe it was called Peace Through Tyranny. So, um, yep. Yeah, yeah that's it. it exactly. Peace through tyranny. Sure, I should know that. Anyway, yeah, um, okay. yeah, you were, you were saying that's one of those albums where, you know, I actually recorded it at home because I have to kind of do it in between things. I would have initially the plan was for Gus to come out to Los Angeles and we would play it together, you know, and just do it in the acoustic studio. But, so there, it ended up being too difficult on time, and we had no budget for it. We just kind of winged it, and we had no record deal or anything like that. So, um, so I just decided to record it at home. And when I sent the drum tracks over to Gus, he was he wouldn't believe that I used the the roll and then the tune track samples to record it. He like he had me tell him like three times, "No, I promise you, it's not acoustic." <laughs> like, <laughs> so that's a testament to how good the stuff can be, because Gus is a drummer himself and a great one at that. So. No, you yeah. can tell the difference. Absolutely. <laughs> That's the first words that came out of his mouth when he called me to tell me about the project and uh, the record. He's like, you're not going to believe this. You're not going to believe this. It's on a V kit. You're not going to believe this. <laughs> I couldn't believe it either. That's I mean, 
then Jeremy was talking yesterday to us about the effects, like um, he, he can take some of the snare drum effects and apply those same S effects. Synthetic resonance to the Yeah, toms. to the other times yeah. and whatnot. And he was having a blast, you know, like this is, this is insane. Yeah. Yeah. He, yeah. yeah you do have some, some benefits from, from using samples. You know, there are some, uh, some cool things you can do. Like you can basically export them where the, the, uh, the bleed and the samples are a separate track. And of course you could never do that in an actual audio recording because those are inevitably blended together. But with MIDI, Tuntra gives you that option. So that means you can work on the Tom sound, let's say, and really get the exact Tom sound you want without affecting everything else at all. So the bleed can still stay the same, you know, which is a really nice option for clarity. I wonder where it's going to be in 10 years. <laughs> well, yeah. I'm good for right now. And I know, John, you had some questions. If you want to go ahead and just, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll leave the forum up to you now for a little bit and I will just be quiet. I have a couple of questions, I guess. Um, you know, like, just kind of touching on like your past a little bit you know like i said when when we first started hearing you you were on the hematopic ep and also you know i forgot to mention uh occult medicine by yarkoon um mm -hmm. and then moving into soil work and uh, like one of the things i was always kind of curious about was what was it like coming in after henry ranta like what was that study session like having to study that guy because that it was pretty intimidating. Yeah, he, he had a very different style kind of from what I was used to playing. It was more sober and like the right fills at the right moment, you know, where I feel like I tend to kind of just hit every drum at all times. I'll always say that, you know, like, I'm, <laughs> like let's see how many notes I can fit everywhere. That was kind of my uh, my approach, you know. And so when I listened to the way he, he, he brought the groove to the songs and just in a very kind of um, sparse way you know I, I feel like mario from gojira is another drummer who, who does that really well who doesn't overplay the songs and uh so i learned a lot from that so probably from like latter henry rant i'm mostly like natural born chaos figure number five era which is the figure number five album is actually the one where i came in and, and did a lot of that touring for that record right. um that was that was a learning uh, curve for me for sure. You know, the the sober guys give me a lot of freedom to just kind of play the songs the way I wanted to, but I really tried to uh, make the songs sound the way people would want to hear them. You know, which is something I've carried over now to Megadeth as well um, as cool. a fan. You know, you you wanna you you want people to. Of course, you're gonna be yourself and you're gonna do little things that you do, but you also don't want to ruin the music for for people. You know, like. They, they know it a certain way. And I know how that feels like when I went to see Slayer, you know, and, 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 you know, I love Lombardo uh, and then both staff came in and it sounded very different. And that took me some getting used to, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, it's, 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 it's just a very different style and not to bash him because he's just his own drummer and that's the way it is. But I know what it feels like, you know, so to, to kind of have to have to adapt to that. So I really tried to crawl into the skin of like Henry Ranta and <laughs> just, do the best version of him that i could <laughs> i hear you there i i i think you know like the way the way you mentioned dave lombardo against paul bostaff um like going even further back like what it sounded like when nico mcbrain was playing clive burr parts and like when i was young you know while nico might have been a more technic technically proficient drummer like i kind of took a cue of that and i kind of started going into other bands and changing things too much um All right and like with your background being in death metal and lots of blast beats and lots of double bass and a lot of technical stuff like how does that transfer over into a band like megadeth that has been you know a benchmark in thrash metal music you know invented the art um what do some of those guys look at you like when you play some of this stuff in front of them <laughs> like dirt black like well, how does dave how does dave mustaine react to the dirk blast well it, it, he actually really loved that i actually started doing that in a song from dystopia which i didn't record the record but it has like this triplet part that you know isn't played exactly like a dirt blast but i was like oh i can play one there and so we, when we did the video for that song i think that's when he first noticed that i was doing it slightly differently and he was like what's that that's so cool you know he loved it so i was like okay good because <laughs> he could have not liked it but uh, he, he really enjoyed that and so he, he's yeah i think he's just you know for him it's like kind of a 
something that he, of course, he's heard music like that over the years. You know, he does his own radio show on Give Me Metal, and he plays like Arch Enemy and all kinds of bands. You know, he he knows stuff, but but to, I think to see me do it, like it, it just it's it's fun for him. You know, he's given me a, a quite a few funny reactions. And as a matter of fact, we did try at one point in the studio to put like an old school blast beat over a riff, and that was his right. incentive. He's like, try and play a blast beat on this, you know. And I did, and we we listened back, and we were like. Yeah, it doesn't. It just doesn't sound like Megadeth at all. It just felt out of place, you know. Even for me, I was like, eh, you know, this is not, <laughs> this is not right. So, because everybody was like, you know, people were saying like, oh, are you gonna blast on the album and stuff? And it needs to fit, you know. I'm not just gonna shoehorn it in there just because. I mean, that would just be silly. So, so, but yeah, no, he he likes all that stuff. <laughs> That's like Robin Stone from Australia doing blast beats over like <laughs> journeys any way you want it, yeah. or Stone in Love or something on his videos, which are great, by the way. Sorry. Yeah. Robin's great. Yeah. Um, but like, you know, carrying on with that, take like, for instance, the song Soldier On, and you recently did a video of you were working your swivel technique through that. Is that how you actually play the song or is that actually is that actually double bass or do you actually get to utilize what would what death metal band, what a death metal drummer would utilize for a single foot blast as a double bass part? I didn't record it like that. That was just me trying to see if I could, you know, right. do that speed consistently and, and uh, you know, just as an exercise because I always like to try and keep up my chops even when I'm on the road with Megadeth and we don't mm -hmm. necessarily play a lot of fast stuff. I mean, the fastest stuff we play is probably 190 BPM, you know, which is right. a new song, which, you know, hopefully we'll play that on stage so I can get to practice that muscle too. But in the on the jam kit i'm usually practicing way faster than that just because i don't want to completely lose my technique which i've been i went through that a little bit in the first year's touring with megadeth where i was kind of like okay i'm doing this now and then i'd go back and you know uh, some band or artist would send me like a a black metal album with songs that 250 dtm and i'd be like oh man i have yep. to practice for a month to, <laughs> to get back to this you know i used to be able to do this and now i, I kind of forgot how and my body's like nope so <laughs> I guess that's also the joys of growing older, right, John? Do, do you ever, like, I have a question for you. Do you ever feel like as you get older, like, it takes more practice to kind of stay at the same level or no? It takes practice to stay at that level. It's, um, I, I, I tell friends that get into their 40s, especially musician friends, that, you know, depending on what happens in your 40s, a lot of bad things can happen. I think, I think uh, you know, a lot of people really get dragged down into like really bad depression issues if they make it into their 40s and you know i remember somebody saying something along the lines of yeah your 40s are your final good decade but like a lot of things i'll say to drummers and musicians it's like you know your 40s they're a little frightening at first but you just got to pay attention a little more you got to drink a little bit more water you have to stretch out a little bit more you just got to be a little bit smarter about it um so yeah i've got i've i have uh i'm working on carpal tunnel i'm dealing with it right now i've got some knee issues but it's it really is down to just you know getting more sleep drinking more water you don't get to eat burger king as much you don't get to drink alcohol you don't get to party as much you just but hopefully you learn how to enjoy being an adult and um you know to bounce that back at you i believe you're vegan correct how do you maintain yeah, that on, right. on 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 the road i mean that's that is some that's interesting to me yeah, so it's it is interesting, you know. I'm I'm vegan from a purely ethical standpoint. So when I met my wife, uh, we're married 16 years now. When I met her, she had been a vegetarian since basically late 80s. At a time when basically when you were a vegetarian, everyone looked at you like you were crazy, and there were no options anywhere. You know, I was like, what do you mean? Like, you're gonna start eating meat again tomorrow, right? Like that's what her parents told her when she started. You know. But she was into bands like Minor Threat and the whole hardcore scene that was very vocal yep. about animal abuse and, and animal cruelty and all that. And so she just never, never went away from that, you know, stayed with that. So when I met her, she kind of converted me and showed me like, look, you can you can do things differently. And I tried it and it worked for me very easily. And then from there, a number of years after being vegetarian, I decided, you know what, I'm going to cut out dairy too, because I find the mm -hmm. dairy industry to be just as horrible as, as, uh, as you know, other animal agriculture and i'm talking about like the big you know the big production i'm not talking about yep. you know it's all it's all argument like small small farms small like family-owned farms can sometimes do things a much better way you know and a lot mm -hmm. of them do but 99 percent or over 90 percent of the 
the meat and dairy we get is produced in ways where animals are just treated like objects, you know, and they get completely deprived of any of their natural behaviors. They live a life of basically darkness, pain and suffering. And it's just something that I just decided, you know what, there's enough out there, especially where I live in Los Angeles, which is a very vegan friendly city. I have no reason other than selfishness to be a part of this, you know, and because I care, I've always cared about animals since I was a little kid. I was like, it's just the right thing for me to do. And so on tour, answer your question you know we have usually we have a good setup for that but there are times when i have to kind of you know make a decision and sometimes i have to do something vegetarian because i also don't want to be that asshole that's like yeah you know nope this isn't working for me i'm the one guy you know and you have to go make something else for me for me it's more about you know being practical and being a being a good person to be around at the same time so i'm not going to be like super hardcore about it when it's not the moment to be that. I also don't talk people's ears off about being vegan, you know, unless somebody asks me about it because I find nobody wants to be told what to eat. Just like I don't want to be told what to eat or what to do. Nobody else does. So I usually, but I found that just doing it makes a lot of people ask questions and that's inspiring. And I always tell people, here's a big thing. And I'm really happy to get a chance to say this. People tend to think that like either you're vegan or you're not, you're vegetarian or you're not. If not, it doesn't matter. It's like this black and white thing. And the truth is that's not true. If everybody had one vegan day or one vegetarian day in the week where they're like, okay, today, like I'm going to do try other stuff, you know, no, no meat on the plate, whatever, no fish, no dairy, whatever you want to do. It would make a massive difference in the world. Like imagine like if the whole planet did that, you know, and there was one day out of seven where you didn't need any of that stuff, it would change the industry massively. Just like, Vegans have changed it because what what we're like seven eight percent of people in the U.S. and that's a small percentage compared to the total. But look how many vegan options are available pretty much everywhere now because of that seven eight percent. Because nobody wants to miss out. No smart company is like, oh yeah, we'll just forget about seven percent of the buyers. No, you can't do that. You know that's why a lot of these big meat companies are now also making vegan options, right? So yeah. that's what I tell people. You don't have to be vegan. You don't have to be vegetarian. If you care about this stuff, just try it one day in the week. And if that's all you want to do, great. That's awesome. You make a difference, believe it or not. Yeah, Simple. step by step. And I'm having I'm having a lot more vegetarian days these days. And I just feel better, a thousand times better. Um, yeah. yeah. It's a good point, Dirk. It's a really good point. And I'm sorry to interrupt, John, but oh, absolutely. And this might be silly, but something I've been doing for a long time, which is kind of in theory the same to save money and save water, is we take like a an empty liter bottle of Coke and fill it with water and drop it in the back of your toilet tank and you'll save that much water every time you flush. I know it's silly, but it adds up. It's just yeah, about absolutely. that little little part of something eventually will make a, a bigger impact or change to that same something. So very good point, sir. I absolutely agree. And I want to follow up on that because I think it's one of the big things, you know, we tend to, you know, the media when you read stuff as much as a lot of media mean, well, you know, you tend to feel this overwhelming feeling of like, there's just too much crap going on. Nothing I can do matters. I'm just one small human out of 7 billion. Like nothing I can do makes any difference. It's pointless. Fuck it all. You know, like I'm not going to vote. I'm not going to this because it doesn't matter. You know, you get this feeling of like helplessness and like, you know, like that. And the truth is like, if we all did, like I said earlier, you know, if we all did little things to make a difference, like I'll tell you what my wife and I do, we have, you know, we're in California, we have an AC in the house. We need to, we're in the Valley. It gets freaking hot. So we have a thing underneath the, where the water comes out, you know, the condensation water from the, from the AC. And that's pretty much what we use to water our plants in the backyard. Like that's cool. You know, eight or nine months out of the year because that water is already there and it's very simple. And it's things like that where you can just be like, I could either be wasting a bunch of water or I could do it in a way where I reuse it. You know, what's the best way to do it? If you're smart, you go like, okay, you know, I'll do that. I'll do it the way where I save a little bit. Is that contribution anything in the big scheme of things? No, it's not. You know, it's tiny. But if everybody did that, it would be massive. That's all. Well, you know? you're nobody. Yeah, you're never too small to make a difference when you consider what it feels like when you get a mosquito under the bed sheet. Yeah, that's exactly true. <laughs> Dirk's going to go home and fill up some liter bottles for his toilet. I'd know it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I am. <laughs> so um, what is, uh, like, kind of going back through this, um, 
I think a lot about this from a modern drummer interview I read with Paul Bosdep, and he was talking about being on tour with Sacred Reich. Sacred Reich was, he was in Forbidden, he was hanging out with Greg Gall from Sacred Reich there on tour, and they were both watching Dave Lombardo play, and they were both going, I would play it this way, I would play it this way. So I guess I'm kind of curious, kind of a two-part question is like, what are some of your favorite little bits in these Megadeth songs? Like, what's your, like, do you have a favorite Gar Samuelson bit? Do you have a favorite Nick Menza bit? Um, and what's that like being able to dig into those parts and like play those things, you know? It's, it's a lot of fun. Um, um, Dave, at one point after I'd been in the band for a while, some months, you know, he said, I'm going to send you all those. I'm going to have my producer send you all the stems because he bought back, you know, the rights to all his older records at some point. So he has like all the tracks. He's like, I'm going to send you the stems so you can hear the drums and you can really get deep into the details, which was a lot of fun. Yeah. Some stuff like, especially with Gar on the first two records, because of the recording quality at the time, you can't really hear what he's doing unless you take everything else away. So I had to rechart a lot of those older songs, which was a lot of fun. And I, I, I learned that some things I was just, was just wasn't doing right. One of my favorite Gar things that he does is it's, it's actually kind of similar to, to what a Dirk Blast is, except there's just an alternated stroke, but it's an alternated stroke where the first hit is a crash cymbal and a kick, and then the next two hits are on the snare. And then it switches hands because it's a triplet. So, you know, you're going to have right, left, right. And then the next hit on your crash and kick is going to be with your left hand and then right, yeah. left on the snare. And he does that really fast. He does that in a bunch of different songs. It's a very mm -hmm. Gar thing to do. So that's that's what I call the Gar fill. So that's a fun thing. <laughs> I believe Brandon Thomas used to use that in Dimmock as kind of a blast beat thing. If, if there are any drummers out there that go back and understand who Brandon Thomas is. Oh, yeah. You know, he would, you know, back ripping corpse. yeah, ripping, ripping corpse, corpse, you know, and he, yes. there's uh yeah, I think mm -hmm. I believe it's the first song from Intercepting Fist and he just, he does, it's the same thing. He just smashes it up much faster and it kind of turns into a, like a blast beat thing and it's beautiful. And I know exactly what you're talking about. Yeah. Gar yeah. was digging into his drumming is, is fascinating, but it is, and, it is. Uh, he had a really unique approach. He had that he had that jazz fusion approach, and it's it's just cool that um, in talking to a lot of drummers throughout my my you know humble career, it's been like, though this guy plays a lot of jazz, this guy plays a lot of jazz, he's got a lot of jazz flair going on. That guy's got a lot of jazz flair. Fuck, man. Oh, sorry. Um, Gar Samuelson came into Megadeth as a jazz fusion drummer, so it's always been there, and it's just really cool. Um, Right. What's your What's your favorite? I got one more question. What's your favorite piece of gear that you've had forever that you can't live without? And then I got no more questions. Yeah. Oh gosh, um, that is a great question. I have to think about that one, John. <laughs> I think probably the most sensitive thing is the pedals. I guess a lot of drummers would agree with that. It's the thing where. Even if you have good technique, you can land on some pedals sometimes where you're like, okay, there's not much I can do with this because they're set up so differently and they're, they just feel so weird to me that, you know, it doesn't mm -hmm. work. So mm -hmm. recently, you know, I always played Chain Drive. I did the Iron Cobra, the Speed Cobra, when that came out. And then recently when when I did the DynaSync testing, like I told you guys earlier, yeah. I decided, yeah, I'm going to try this. I've never really found a direct drive pedal that spoke to me, but this one might be the one, so I'm going to try it. And it was a long adaptation period for me coming from chain drive all my life. But now I'm so happy I went through it because I just love that pedal. It allows me to get more out of less work. And it's really allowed me to perfect my swivel, um, which is, you know, for those who don't know, it's when your um, your feet kind of go like this on the pedals and you get a, a nice movement out of that, a nice, a nice motion. So it's something that I always struggle with on my right foot. Uh, I remember going through this with Mike Heller when we were on tour together, Fear Factory, and Soul Work was opening for them. And he's a very, uh, very advanced technical guy like yourself, John. And so he was trying to get me to, to get my right foot to, to do the same thing as my left foot. My left foot would swivel easily and naturally, and the right foot was just struggling. But with the Dynasyncs, with these new Tama pedals, I really, you know, managed to, and then spending a lot of time practicing, of course, but I managed to get to a place where now I, I feel like I, I play better double bass than ever, more precise, less effort. And that's fun. You know, it's a nice feeling to finally be able to play, uh, you know, uh, I don't know, uh, Rapture by Morbid Eagle without like dying halfway through. <laughs> oh, 
The swivel is fascinating, man. Um, I, I did not like it for a long time because I watched a lot of guys do it. And I always, you know, go, you know, touching on the jujitsu thing, I always thought that that looked like lateral movement for the knee and that that was going to hurt your knee. But I think I ended up seeing the drummer from Surreption play and noticed that his hips were much looser. So his kind of his whole thigh was sort of moving and his knee was not cranking. So that took me back to the drawing board. And like yeah. you, I assume you're right-handed. Are you? Yep. You're right-handed player. I'm a right-handed player. My left foot can swivel, no problem. My right wouldn't do it. And I've just barely broken through maybe two months ago to make it can go bu 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 And that is about it. You know, I got about four yeah. bars in there, and then I got to stop and start it again. So I'm right. I'm following you. I'm, I'm kind of following you on this, this, uh, this swivel thing. Yeah. Surruption, by the way, yeah, Tony here. Westermark. Oh, yeah. Tony Westermark. There you yeah. go. Great, yeah. great, great. Yeah. Bar. yeah. Yes, absolutely. Just, just saw him not that long ago. Okay. Yeah. Um, Devil's Island or Tornado of Souls? What's that? Devil's Island or Tornado of Souls? <laughs> Man. Uh... I'm probably going to say Devil's Island just because Peace Else was the, the first album I bought by Megadeth. So that one has a has a deep meaning for me. But Tornado Souls is a fan favorite and has one of mm. Marty Friedman's, if not his best mm. guitar solo. So people yeah. always love when we play that song. And, you know, if, I don't think we've ever played Devil's Island when I was in the band, actually. So, so you know, I like him both. <laughs> all right. That's well, it is Friday and we're all wearing black. So there's that. <laughs> <laughs> Did you have another question, Very John, true. about the uh, the flam and the blast? Oh, the the okay, yeah, that's uh, that's okay. I'm sorry for those of you that are not drummers, but Dirk, the Dirk blast. Um, like I was saying, it is it a flam? A is it a flam accent that has been kind of turned into almost a a unison that you're bouncing? Because you could you explain that? Yes. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so it, it is a flam accent. And, and the way it came about is that, so I had this teacher when I was going to music school. So at the time I was probably about 19 years old, quite a few years ago. And I had asked him, he was a, he's, a, he's a jazz guy and just, but a very well versed guy and a very good teacher. I asked him, what do I do when I want to bring something into my playing? Cause I was kind of practicing rudiments and then not really knowing what to do with them. Like, okay, I can do single paradiddle all the variations awesome and now what you know what do i do with that because i didn't you know at the time i was i'd been playing drums for four years five years and i just didn't really know where to go so he said well it's simple just whatever it is you want to do just play it all around the kid just goof around for a half hour play it on your toms on your cymbals on your kicks whatever just make combinations and and after a while it'll start feeling natural and you'll find ways by going through all the things that don't sound good you'll find some stuff that does sound good and you'll start having ideas so I, I applied that to various patterns, including the flam accent, which was a pattern we were studying at the time. And so I just happened to, at some point, you know, play the the first hit of the flam on the hi hat, and then all the other hits on the snare. And then so it became this thing where, oh, this is kind of a cool movement. And oh wait, there's like snare drums continuing all the time. It sounds like some kind of blast beat in triplets. Interesting, you know. So then all I had to do was basically put kicks underneath. And I had some kind of blast. And uh, at the time, I didn't think much about it at all. We had a song with my my band at the time, Scarf, that I put it in. And and I kind of forgot about it after that. You know, didn't really think too much about it. But then many years down the line, it, it saved my ass a few times when <laughs> when uh, bands like Cybreed would throw a song at me at 280 BPM. I did a, yeah. a studio session with them. And, and I was like, there's no way I could blast the normal blast beat at 280 BPM. So let me just see if I can kind of adapt this dirt blast idea and change the sticking a little bit and make it work. So then I found a way to kind of follow the accents in the guitar riff and adapting the sticking a little bit. And that, that saved me. Same thing a few years later with uh, with uh, Devin Townsend, the deconstruction album. A lot of really fast stuff there that I was like, if I didn't have the dirt blast, I'd have to. <laughs> come up with something different, you know? So it saved me a few times. The reason why is just because it's less, it, it's easier physically to do, I think, once you get it down than like a continuous blast beat that's like just nonstop hits, you know? Here you get a little bit of time to rest on each hand, so, and you still get, you know, a, a blast kind of feeling, even though it's not exactly the same, but 
anyways, I never thought much about it and it became this thing. And then my wife said to me, why don't you call it something, you know, like you should do a video about this. And I was like, ah, you know, I felt like that was like a pretentious thing to do. I'm like, I don't want to like, you know, it's just some stupid thing. You know, she's like, no, you should make a video about it. Like people are asking you about it. They'll enjoy it. So then I did a video. I said, fine, like whatever. I'll call it the Dirk Blast if you say so, you know, whatever. That's cool. And then that's the first video I actually ever put on YouTube. I checked the other day because I forgot. And I was like, oh, this is the first thing I ever put up, you know, I, like many years ago. And yeah, now like, like it's it's this thing, I guess, you know, I mean, again, I don't want to sound like pretentious about it. I don't feel like I invented anything important. And of course not. it's not like that. That's not who I am. You know, it's just a fun thing. And I just happened to come up with it. I know there's other drummer, other drummers that have probably done it in different ways way before me. But you know, I, I honestly didn't steal it from anybody. I came up with it as an exercise and used it over the years. And then people would come up to me and be like, hey, what, what's the sticking you're doing? I like that. You know, that's kind of how it went. <laughs> I don't think it's ever about claiming invention on something as much as it is just trying to show the world your variation on something that they've probably already heard. And, you know, and this is how I can show you how to do this. And that's, you know, because, you know, people just saying he didn't invent that. But no, he didn't invent that. I didn't invent double strokes. Um, I just used them in a way that I think people enjoyed. So, but that's what right. I got. Right. Back to you, Ian. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, John. <laughs> no worries. Um, well, Let's talk about something I'm going to pop up on the screen and we'll kind of work that into a little bit about what it was like for you growing up as a kid listening to Megadeth. Like you said earlier, now you got the shirt on here. You're sitting in this hotel room on tour with Megadeth. You just wrote an album with Megadeth. This image uh, to me, I got chills actually the other day when it popped up because I'm ex just ecstatic for, for you and what you must be feeling, um, <clears throat> seeing an, uh, an image like this, you know, the sick, the dead, and the dying, I'm sorry, the sick, the dying, and the dead, uh, highest charting Megadeth album of all time, um, number three Billboard Top 200, number one top album sales, number one top current album sales, rock and alternative, top rock, top hard rock, I mean, it, just, it goes on and on and on, and it's global. Um, so first of all, huge congratulations. And uh, right, congratulations. You. if so. you can even put it into words, what's what's that what's that like when, you know, you're sitting down and, and, and collaborating with these guys, some of who have, you know, been original members. And now you have your name on a Megadeth record where you contributed. I mean, you got to be beside yourself. Man. Yeah, I'm, I'm just humbled. I'm just I'm just thankful to be here that's the best way i can put it um, i'm i can't even say that this is a dream come true because i don't think i ever dreamed anything crazy like that i was just happy to be playing drums and you know trying to make a living off of doing it in itself was a, a gratifying thing for me it wasn't always easy and i don't think any good job is is always easy it was a struggle sometimes and um, but you know i never thought like oh i should be in this major band you know like i, I whatever and uh, so when it kind of just happened, I mean, I'm still kind of pinching myself to this day. At the same time, I have to say that I, I worked really hard my whole life. I've always been somebody who, as I mentioned earlier, I think when I do something, I do it 100%. And to persevere through the hard times and always try to keep my head up and try to keep learning new things, it's paid off in the long run. There there have been times when I wanted to give up, like, like anybody, you know, and when things seem a bit hopeless. You, you know, there's a few times throughout my life where I thought maybe I should just get a normal job and, and life will be a bit more simple, you know, and I can just stay home and not struggle to try and pay the bills and work my ass off like 24-7, no weekends, no time, all that, just to have a normal family life. But in the end, I know where my passion is, and so I, I, I wouldn't give up, and I have to give a lot of credit to my parents and my wife and my teachers and my friends, everybody who supported me, my family over the years, you know, doing this. I owe it to them because they've helped me so tremendously so many times and, and talked me back into doing what I wanted to do and when it seemed a bit hopeless. So, but, you know, to answer your question, it's an incredible feeling. I'm, I'm so stoked that people are enjoying the new album overall. And I'm just, I'm just happy to be a part of it. I'm happy to have contributed to it because I didn't know going into this, how that part would be, you know, being on tour with the band was one thing, like play the songs, here's the songs. Cool. 
you know, get to know the guys, get to know the way the band operates on the road. Now going into the recording studio or, or first rather into the, you know, the band room and start writing stuff, I had no idea. And Dave said early on to us, to me and Kiko and David at the time, bring bring stuff, bring ideas. I want your ideas. I'm like, cool. You know, I, I wrote some stuff. I wrote, I play a little bit of guitar. So I made some demos at home, recorded some riffs, recorded some song ideas, brought them on. I didn't anticipate that any of my stuff would go anywhere because I mean, come on, this is Dave Mustaine we're talking about, you know, like who am I on guitar compared to Dave Mustaine or Kiko Lurero for that matter it was like one of the best guitar players in the world, you know, like I, I'm nothing compared to that. Nevertheless, you know, I ended up with some, some stuff on the album, like the song Life in Hell, which is the second song on the record is based on a demo I wrote. And then I also have a riff in the third song, Night Stalkers, which everybody just enjoyed that riff and was like, we need to use this. And so I'm like, my mind is just blown because I didn't anticipate that, you know. But I'm again, I'm happy I just went for it and listened to Dave and tried and, uh, and, and, and went along with his idea and proposed some things. That's the proof that you have to believe in yourself. You know, you have to believe that you can do what you want to do. And I did want to contribute. I mean, I was like, it would be cool if I could because this is a band I love. And if I can, if some of my ideas can inspire the other guys and we can make a song together, hey, that's freaking cool. You know, if I can do something else than just write the drum parts on the album, that's freaking cool. So, so here we are. It actually happened, and 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 people are loving the thrashy direction of this record in general. And you know, I'm I'm not ashamed to say that I'm definitely a part of kind of pushing that envelope because that's the Megadeth I grew up with. Peace sells, killing is my business. You know, the next couple albums after that, that's that's the Megadeth I enjoyed that I saw live back in 1990 on the Clash of the Titans tour for the Rust in Peace album. So. You know, yeah, it's 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 a wonderful feeling. I'm I'm thankful every day, and I enjoy every single day we're out here. <laughs> That's all I can awesome. say. <laughs> very very good. Are you good on time, sir? I am good. I'm I'm having it fun. <laughs> as long as you yeah. guys are, I'm good. <laughs> no, I definitely want to take a couple of these comments and questions from some of the people that are in here um, asking. There's one that just popped in there. Yeah, Ken Schalk and Angel Cote just popped Angel in. Angel Cote, but... man, that's a great question. Before I jump into Angel's question, I must say the Florida trip that you took to do the tribute playing uh, the death songs, uh, we talked about last night for a minute with Jeremy, and it was a power out, uh, huge power outage here where I live. Nothing, the whole neighborhood down, nothing. So I had paid for the stream, and I went out to my car, and I took my phone, and you know, you know, I had a beer or whatever, and I put my phone up on the dashboard and paired it to my, you know, the, the speakers in in the car, and I sat there and I watched the entire thing from start to finish. It, you know, as loud as the stereo would go in the car, which is not too bad. And I got to tell you, man, I know I've told you this before, but I'm going to say it again now because we're on here because I have to reiterate. All the songs were amazing, but especially the songs that you played that night. I think there were three that were from human you did them incredible justice man incredible justice and you know i know you and sean were friends and we were friends and rest in peace sean what was that like how long did you have to prepare for that night and emotionally i mean not to get too personal but how did you just get through it man it was incredible it was it was a bit tough at times emotionally especially because my friendship with sean me and my wife just became friends with him kind of out of the blue, like four or five years before he sadly passed in 2020. And, you know, it just became a very natural thing. It wasn't even centered around music per se. I mean, of course we would talk about music, but it wasn't like, let's, let's hang and jam drums all day. Him and his husband would come to our house or we'd go to their house and we'd watch a movie or play, we played a lot of board games, the silly games, you know, like, and just laughed. And Sean was such a funny guy. And it was just, you know, it was just a wonderful friendship and 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 then when he very unexpectedly passed it was such a heartbreaking time and um this happened just at the beginning of the pandemic and we had this little get together actually at my house because sean's husband tom asked us if we would do that for him have a little get together and so sean's sister came over with her husband and jason gobel from cynic and gus rios you know we talked about earlier from kill division it was was known Sean for many, many, many years. It was one of his closest friends. Gus was absolutely devastated. And so he did a little, you know, a lot of fr other friends. We did a little tribute yeah, Rain memorial and to Sean. Came and Anton came. Yes, I, Raiden. I still, yeah. I'm sorry to interrupt you during that. That's awful. Um, I just, 
it was hard not being there. It was the same weekend my first daughter was moving into college, and I, you know, I could not be right. there for that. And I, I it yeah. sucks that I couldn't be there, but it was awesome of you to open up your home for for that. And uh, again, back to you covering those songs, man. <laughs> wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so obviously, with all that being said, for me, it was it was you know, Human was a life changing album, as I think it was for many a, a drummer at, at the time. Kashan just brought so much new energy and new inspiration into extreme metal drumming. You know, from my from my point of view, at least, and I just mm -hmm. love the music on that album in general great songs, you know, not just Sean, everything was great. So when it came to covering those songs, I really w wanted to do it right. You know, I knew his sister was going to come to, to one of the shows and not that she necessarily knows what paradiddle I'm playing or whatever, but I just, it just mattered to me to do it right. You know, playing with Steve, you know, who was on the record. I mean, that was massive. So, so I spent a lot of time <laughs> at the rehearsal room and there were times where I was literally like, I remember one time I was trying to figure out some parts in Secret Face, which I had the, I had the guts to propose that song. And then I was trying to learn it. I was like, what did I put myself into? Because I couldn't figure out what the hell Sean's playing. And I was like, literally pointing at the sky, like, Sean, you bastard, you know, like, why aren't you here so I can ask you what you do here, you know? So I just yeah. bit through it and, and, and I think kind of figured out what's going on. And I started with the human songs. I had about five weeks to learn the, the set. So that's in my book, that's a long time, you know. And, yeah, um, yeah. and I, just, I just went in and just, you know, listened to bits sometimes a hundred times trying to figure out what it was. And I think in the end, I was probably 90% there, you know. But it was that's the thing. It was a, a lot of those parts, man. There's so yeah. much going on underneath that you don't know about, really. You can't hear yeah. it because of the way things were recorded back in those days. But, um, right. you know, Dave Colross and I used to have a jam hall next to each other in this warehouse, you know, lockout, if you will, which you guys call it out West. But when that album came out, like three days later, Dave knew the record because he lived with Sean down in Florida and he came back right. up home and, you know, I asked him to show me textures and he did. And um, there was this whole extra section of ghost notes that no, you couldn't even really hear within the song, but he had played it for Dave. So Dave could play it for me. And nice. it was mind blowing. There's so much going on underneath that you can't hear unless maybe you have, you know, the notation or charts or whatever you want to call them. Um, but you, you, you nailed it, man. You nailed it. It was, it was amazing to listen to and watch, man. With especially you know, no triggers, man. And it, you know, why would you? <laughs> but yeah, 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 it was, it was perfect, man. Perfect. Thank you. There was that. Uh, there was that cassette that was moving around a while ago. I remember being down in Tampa in 1997 recording the, the second Angel Corpse record, and there was a cassette that they had that was just the drums and the bass from the Human Sessions. Just the drums and the bass. And there would be these intermittent dips in... It would just cut out for like a half second and then keep going. And I remember I lost that tape a long time ago. I don't even know if you can find it on the internet, but I know it was out and around. But I always remembered hearing what was going on with the bass and hearing what was going on with all the subtle stickings and like all the ghost notes and all that kind of stuff, like how different that album would have sounded if you could actually hear all that stuff, you know, just to, yeah, yeah. you know, to, to yeah. capitalize on how things were recorded then and how there was so many layers and you just couldn't really hear a lot of the stuff. And you really, I mean, well, they just remixed focus. Yeah. So you might have that answer to that question pretty soon. This is, they remixed focus. Really? Hmm. Oh, oh, they, yeah, they remixed they wow. they human. Yeah. human too. Sorry to interrupt, yeah, but they, they remixed no, human no, too. There's a 2011 mix, which is actually a yeah. lot better. Yeah, you can hear it a I, little more on the human remix, but like back oh, in those yeah. days, yeah. before any of those remixes happened, that was a mind blowing little piece of. I didn't like the human yeah. remix. I got to say it. I've got to be careful what I say, but it just I didn't like it. Um, I'm excited to hear. Oh, what really? they did with the Yeah, I, you know, it's nostalgia. It's. Oh, the human remix. You didn't like it. Gotcha. I, I didn't like it. I thought it was too much. I just hope that the Focus yeah. remix is not the same. But uh, I'm looking forward to checking it out anyway. Well, I but. did not like the Traced in Air remix because they took out all the brutal vocals. Oh, you know, yeah. It's a little strange. That's, a, that's not a remix at that point. <laughs> it's a little odd. You know, but okay. Yeah. All right. Well, um, if you guys, uh, if you're cool still, uh, Dirk, I'm just going to, uh, everybody that's watching us right now, thank you uh, for joining us. We're uh, Go ahead and just, you know, I know we're going to get bombarded here, but 
there's a couple questions I'll start with. And if anybody has any other questions uh, for the next maybe 10 or 15 minutes before we head out of here, go ahead and comment on the uh, YouTube video and we'll see how many of them we can get up on the screen real quick uh, for, for Dirk to check out. Um, I'm going to just go back and start with uh, Angel Cote. And I'm sorry if I'm saying your last name wrong, I apologize. John, is it is it Cote or Cote? Do you know? It's Cote. Cote. All right. He's so one of the sweetest men I know. You have to have him on sick drummer. He's a fantastic drummer. So Angel says, nice. you got to ask him, you got to ask Dirk about the record. He and Mike Heller finished off after the untimely passing of the legendary Sean uh, Reiner. And I'll take that off. What uh, What's he talking yes. about there? So that's a record called, um, the band is called Aerosol. And um, um, actually, John Heiler um, and Matt Brownlee, who, who are the two people who, who put that band together with, with Sean before he passed, they were also both at the little memorial we had for, for Sean. And that's where the idea came up. Mike was there too. And, and John and Matt approached us and said, you know, we have a few recordings of Sean, but he didn't finish all the drums. Would you guys be willing to you know, both of you to, to, to record a couple of songs and then we can finish this record. So, of course, we said absolutely. And uh, the following year we did, and that turned out to be the album Murmurations. And um, there are a couple of songs which, which, which are some of Sean's latest or last recordings he ever did on there, and they're wonderful. And it's more of a pop rock kind of thing, but with a lot of progressive elements. So, yeah, you can check it out online, Aerosol, if you find it. Really cool stuff. Now Mike I know did an amazing job here. I did hear it actually. Yeah. I believe yeah. Sean was on two or th maybe two or three tracks on that. I think. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Awesome. Yeah. <clears throat> oh, hey, let's just pop this up on the screen because it's not a question, but hey, uh, why not? Thank you for joining us, Mr. Ken. Oh, okay. Kenny. Nice. Oh man. Thank you, Ken. A monster drummer in his own right. Oh my gosh! <laughs> uh, yes, that, that man terrified me. I we, we were able to tour with him in two thousand one. Origin, Candiria, and Cryptopsy. My God! Oh, I didn't, I didn't know what wow. I was watching. It was fantastic. <laughs> That's a crazy drummer tour right there. My uh -huh. goodness. Yeah, I would argue that too. I would say that could be like you just take away the other band members and just have like a drum master class every night with you three guys. Oh my God. <laughs> Watching Candiria as a whole, watching that whole unit work like that was, I mean, we we took so much from that tour and just, we had a lot of, what would Candiria do when we were writing Informus? So, WWCD, yeah. only if we knew back then how popular the hashtag would have been in 1993. Woo! My band actually got to open up for Candiria a couple of times way back in the day around 1993, 94, up here in Rochester, John, where I met you at the Penny Arcade. Ah, yes, I remember. I've played with Candiria in that venue, and they are just as good now as they were then. That's um, awesome. Amazing. Here it is, uh, here's a question for, uh, for Dirk from a guy named Joshua Wilson. How did you come up with the parts for Deconstruction song? Uh, obviously, Devin Townsend. Uh, yep, there it is. Did Devin come up with some stuff, or did he let you have at it? Same with Jular. How did that process go? Thanks, Josh. Hey, Josh. Yeah. So basically, Devin for that record had some demos together. I believe those both songs, he had a demo with like roughly programmed drums on them. Um, and then we got together. You can actually find a little bit of their short sections of, uh, of, of us rehearsing the songs, just me and him together, because before we recorded, he wanted to take a few days to go through stuff with me. So I went to this little studio outside of Vancouver where he lives and and, uh, and just went over stuff, and, and uh, you can find that online. But um, he had a rough outline there, but very rudimentary program drums, and then he just said, just do whatever you want with that, you know, just have at it. And later later songs on, on deconstruction came together kind of in the studio, and, you know, I, I just came up with stuff on the spot. But I will say about that recording, that was one of the most fun ones I ever did, just because if you know Devin, you know, he's... <laughs> He's one of the most funny guys on the planet. And, yes. and you never know what to expect at every turn, what's going to happen. He was open to the craziest ideas. I did some really silly stuff on that record. Like at one point there was, thanks, Maddox. <laughs> at one point there was a, a time where I was like, hey, it would be really cool if I just grabbed all my drumsticks and threw them on the kid here. And so you can hear that in one of the songs. I just dropped them and it's just like, <laughs> you know, like any any idea was good enough for that album. And, uh, uh, you know, it was just a fantastic experience working with him. 
And I'll also say that um, the next year we did some shows in London. Devin did some shows in London. He 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 did um, one whole album each night, and one of those albums was Deconstruction. So he asked me to do the drums on that, and that is probably the single show that I worked the hardest for to play. Like the single hour on stage that I spent the most time practicing for, because that album is just so insane. And there's parts in there that are just like. <laughs> You know, you just have to practice them 10,000 times before they start yeah. making sense. So yeah, I probably spent like six months preparing for that show. <laughs> he is definitely one of the most talented and animated and energetic uh, men of our time, front men of our time. I, I've seen him live four times now, and every time is a, quite a journey. And to be picked to yes. play with him even is is awesome, too. I know there's been so many drummers. I got to tell you, the the... Have you heard the Kai record, uh, Ki, the project he did? Yeah, that was the actually the, the first one he he played on those four shows. The first one was the yeah that one. Yeah, he had Duris Maxwell drum on that record, who played with Jimi Hendrix. Man, mm. I mean that was awesome. Yeah. It's one of my favorite things he's done, besides deconstruction. Yes. There was a yeah, question a here from somebody record. else that I can't locate because there's so many questions. But somebody wanted to know if there's anything happening with Ben C. If I find it, I'll throw it up while you uh, answer, if you don't yeah. mind. Yeah, of course, Ben C. Yes, yeah, so um, I've been promising an album for quite a while. It's it's currently being printed onto vinyl, so I'm hoping it's going to come out at some point, either later this year or early next year. kind of depends on when it gets done, because vinyl printing takes a long time these days. Yep. Um, but it's all done. It's recorded. It's mixed. It's mastered. There's about 20 songs on it and uh, all new stuff. Uh, I recorded the drums way back in 2014 for that during an impromptu recording session where I just improvised a whole bunch of stuff and, and turned that into songs later. And uh, that's kind of the way I like to work with Ben C is a very spontaneous creation, kind of the total opposite of like, let's sit down and write songs. You know, this is just like, let's play something and see if I can do something with it. So it's very quick and very organic and very spur of the moment. And uh, so, yes, look for that album. It's called The Dormant Ruin. Uh, it has a lot to do, like subject-wise, with some stuff we talked about earlier. All the stuff that's going on with our planet, and you know, just stuff I'm concerned about. Lyrically. How far back? How far back does Ben C go? Uh, 2011. Okay, I might uh, be confusing with something else. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. 2011 is, is when uh, when I started it, and I did the first EP uh, in the end of that year. And then, yeah, I've just been doing it sporadically throughout whenever I have time. You know, it's just a passion awesome. project, really. Growing up with bands like Napalm and Repulsion and Terrorizer and all those bands, Fear of God, and you know, just all the old grindcore bands were very had a big impact on me. Carcass, you know, obviously, like all that stuff. So I just wanted to kind of see if I could do something like that and, and have fun with it. Awesome. Here's another question about another project from Mercedes. Please ask him about the Savage Lands. Thank you, Mercedes. Savage Lands. Yes. So that ties in with the shark with the shark water thing. Uh, I, I briefly mentioned it earlier when we talked about the the shark free uh, initiative. Mm -hmm. So Savage Lands is an NGO that a longtime friend of mine from France, from back in the day when I lived in France, and I we we formed that together. Um, so we used to play in a band together called Art Sonic, one of the actually the first band I ever toured with was just within the French territory, but nevertheless, my first tours, van tours, you know, the whole experience. So he's lived in Costa Rica now for 17 years. He's always been a very ecologically minded activist type person. And he reached out to me and said, hey, you know, they're cutting down so many trees here. People are just coming in and buying this with like swimming pools and fucking basketball courts and whatnot. And that's all fine. But it's a very small country. They have a lot of indigenous animals there, screaming monkeys, you know, or howling monkeys, or whatever they're called in English. You know, all kinds of, all kinds of just you know very rare species. And so he said, if we don't do something, this island is going to get destroyed. You know, like there's got to be hardly any forest left. So we decided to start this NGO called Savage Lands. You can go to savagelands.org to read more about it. But basically, our idea is to involve people, involve the metal community. We've had Andreas Kisser from Sepultura, Kiko from Megadeth, the guys from Gojira. All these people are helping us out. The guys from Loud Blast in France, you know, if you remember that old, that thrash band. Um, they're all helping us out. And what we're doing is we're setting up a lottery where people can win very rare, unique instruments made actually from naturally fallen wood from Costa Rica. 
Wow. And through those lotteries, we're raising money to to be able to build, you know, to rebuild the forest there and to kind of stop it from being destroyed. What people need to know, again, to, to, to echo also a point I made earlier, sorry for being so long-winded about this, but I'm no, no, very no, no. passionate about this stuff, is that planting a tree costs 10 bucks. That's it. So when people think, oh, there's nothing I can do for nature, you know, it's also expensive and so huge and stuff. It's not. Like, if you have a team in place that can take care of the tree the first year, which we do, it's 10 bucks a tree. So then the first year it needs to be watered and tended to to make sure that the roots take, that it grows properly. After that, it's nature does the rest. You're good. So 10 bucks, you know, that's all. Like anybody pretty much in the world, you know, even in the time of distress can, can throw 10 bucks, right? So that's kind of our idea, you yeah. know, is like just sensibilize, make make people aware that these things are happening and that there are still places in the world where we as humans can make a difference. We can change stuff. It's never going to be 100% perfect. We're all aware of that. But I think it's just, it's really a theme of our times, you know. So Savage Lands ties into that. And that's one of the things I, I want to do with my platform. Have you ever talked to Mario or Joe Duplantier about such initiatives? Because I know a lot of their work, especially in the beginnings of Gojira's existence and flying whales particularly is all about the endangerment of species and whatnot. Have you, have you met them and talked to them about any of these kinds of things before? Absolutely. Yeah. I've actually known those guys for a really long time because Scarf, my old band played with them, you know, when they were still called Godzilla just before they changed the name. So that's when mm -hmm. I first met them and they're part of my inspiration. You know, I look at what they did with Amazonia recently which is a huge initiative to help the indigenous tribes of Brazil who are under siege right now from, you know, a corrupt government and just the Amazon being cut down at, at an unprecedented rate. So, so yeah, I, I, um, I, I speak to them about it on a regular basis. They're also, they also gave their blessing to Savage Lands and helped us out. Mario donated a symbol to us uh, the same way I donated a symbol to, uh, to Amazonia, a signed symbol, which raised like 800 euros or something crazy like that like holy shit yes. so you know th there's a lot sorry i just swore <laughs> there's a lot you can do you know uh, um and and um and and those guys are really setting the example that you can still be metal and you can still be cool and all that stuff and also care about the planet it doesn't have to be uncool to do that oh, because they, i know some people for sure about it. <laughs> they've proven that for sure the very first interview I ever did for Sick Drummer Magazine on a tour bus was Mario and they had a translator and everything. And they had all, you know, the, the fresh foods and everything. They were cooking their own stuff on the bus and talking all about it. And um, we've got a few more minutes here. Uh, interestingly enough, my wife loves Gojira and she's a teacher. And she was doing a lesson with her kids, second, third grade level kids, about not judging a book by its cover. Okay. So she took a song into the classroom flying whales played it for these kids and they're all like whoa you're right then she handed out the sheet with the lyrics and they're all like whoa <laughs> i mean it i thought it was a very cool lesson i don't know why if that's relevant or not but they write some really intelligent lyrics and they're obviously passionate and, and, and uh, active in the types of initiative that you are also active and passionate about so it's, it's just pretty cool. And like I said, I'll be putting links into the uh, description of the video afterwards. If you have anything specifically you want me to add to it, just shoot me an email. Um, and that's awesome. that will be added. Uh, here's Thanks. another one that we might have touched on a little bit from uh, Dave Colross Jr. I've heard that some guys get burned out of learning a piece of music because how technical it is. Uh, I guess we talked a little bit about that when you were learning some of this, the, the, the Sean Reinert material for the Florida event. Have you ever had that experience maybe with other music where it's just you throw your sticks up and walk away type of thing? I think is what he's asking. <laughs> yeah, that's a great question, Dave. I mean, um, it happens, you know, that you get these moments of doubt. I'm going to just generalize that. You get these moments where just things seem, seem overwhelming. And when you're home and you can just be like, today's not my day, just walk away and go back the next day or two days later, take a break. Breaks are really important even throughout one day, you know, like sometimes I'll, I'll get in recording mode and I'll just be super focused and I have to remind myself, like, step away for 15 minutes, go outside, walk the dogs, go have yeah. a drink, eat some food, take a break, go back. You'll be amazed at how much quicker you can actually get through the recording when you put those in. But, but yeah, you know, working on deconstruction was uh, especially learning the life set. <laughs> there were a few points where I was like, man, I don't know that, I, uh, that I'm going to be able to do this. 
but I had no choice. You know, I, I had said yes to Devin and I wanted to, to be there for him. So I had to do it. And that's, that's the thing. Like if you commit, you just got to deliver and you do the best you can. I also know what my limits are. Um, if George Kalias asked me tomorrow to go fill in for him in Nile, you know, I'd have to be like, dude, like give me six months to, to learn to play that fast or John for that matter in origin, even more so maybe, you know, like, cause that's even more hyper speed. So it's like, you got to know what, what, what your strengths and your weaknesses are, you know? And, and, and if there's something that you really can't do like one time, okay, I'll tell you this story. So I've been friends with the Meshuggah guys for a really long time too. I've known those guys just by being in Sweden a lot and stuff and being a fan of the band. At one time when Thomas was having a lot of his back issues many years ago, you know, he had some, some back surgery and stuff and he was having trouble playing and he's, he called me and he said, Hey, we have a tour coming up in a couple of weeks and I don't know that I can do it because I'm really struggling with my back. Would you be able to fill in? And this was like, I forget what album it was, but it was like after catch 33, I think, or around there, you know, it started, their music started really to be of an extreme level of complexity. And I said, I think it was that as much as I album. love you. I love yeah yeah exactly i said as much as i love you and i love the band and i would love to just say yes like there's no way i can learn that stuff in two weeks and be comfortable enough to play it it's too much you know like i need months for that i can do it for sure but not in two weeks like it's just i i was like there's no way and he ended up being able to do the tour so it was fine you know but it was one of those things where i had to really be honest and be like i know that this is too much you know i'm gonna i'm gonna have i'm gonna play a crappy show so i'm not gonna do that I had to do the same thing with Hate Eternal, like way back when Eric called me and asked if I could pick up and go within a week. And I was just like, I don't want to ruin your music like that. So I, I have to say no, you know, right. Right. It ended up happening years yeah. later, but yeah. Yeah. There you go. I mean, here's a, here's the beautiful thing. I think you and I seeing things like that and telling stories like that shows people too, that look, we're, we're, we're human and we, you know, there are things sometimes where we have to be reasonable, too, and we respect the music that we play, and we can't just do everything. What we do in all of our fields, whether it's you or, or I or all the drummers like us, you know, it takes a lot of hard work. And when you see the end result, which is when we're on stage kicking ass, you know, and playing the songs, that doesn't just happen overnight. That's not just because, oh, we, we practiced drums a lot when we were younger. No, that's like a continuous, like, journey of learning and practicing and, and getting in shape and learning all the different things that work with that specific band. So yeah, there's a lot to it. I'm going to have to edit this, man. You guys got some really foul mouths. I got to tell you, there's a, <laughs> there's a quest. There's a question I want to bring up. If that's cool. Sure. Which one from chromatic man? He just says origin plus Megadeth tour. <laughs> <laughs> let's do it that would be That's awesome funny. <laughs> here's uh one no, more. it would be great we'll, we'll kind of wrap it Start. up with this. i have one more um question for you myself before we go but anything going on uh from in in significant that's kind of a cool name uh yeah. scarf yeah. what's any is scarf still a thing Scarf. No, Scarf is not really a thing anymore, unfortunately. You know, it, 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 we never broke up, um, but I think it just kind of got to a place where after a few failed attempts to get back together and do stuff, we've just all kind of realized, like, look, it was a pastime. Let it be what it is. And now, especially with Guillaume's death, you know, a few months ago, it's, it's definitely not going to happen. But I think that, you know, sometimes you have to know when it's time to, to leave something alone. It was a wonderful time when we did it. It would kind of feel weird. Now, I'll still play Scarf songs when I do drum clinics, you know, because I, I love some of those songs and I'm very proud of them still and, and of the drum parts and all that. It was very big for my, you know, for me becoming who I am today. But, you know, I never say never, but there's definitely nothing in the works right now. All right. Well, um, on that note, you mentioned drum clinics. Let's just wrap it up with that and segue that. I, I got to stop saying segue. Segue. Uh, <laughs> what i know you're on tour right now so uh how much is left in this tour how long do you have in between the next tour if there is one booked what can we expect from you in the near future and do you maybe have any news on any clinics coming up before we go or are you too busy uh, well this that? tour is still another yeah yeah this tour is still another four and a half weeks or so i believe mm -hmm. if i'm correct 
It's a pretty long one. Um, it's pretty much the last thing we're doing this year. We do have one show in Mexico City in the beginning of December, having an Hellfest, which is a big festival. So it's a cool oh, one. Yeah. So oh, yeah. that's that's yeah, it for this year. One. Yeah, it's really huge. Like one of the biggest crowds I've ever played for. We did it some years ago, and I was just <laughs> it was one of those moments where I just had the chills on stage because you could just see people everywhere as far as you could look, and I was like, wow, this is amazing, you know. But um. Then it's then it's off to next year. So next year we have plans to go to Japan. <laughs> See drummer, there you go. I think, yeah, he was trying to say Segway Drummer Magazine. That's hilarious. <laughs> Segway Drummer. Segway Drummer. Good job. I, yeah, yeah, I love that. Thanks, Mike. Um, with a Y. <laughs> yeah. So so I, I don't have any concrete plans for for drum clinics right now. I'd love to do some more. There was a time there in the early 2010s when I went to China I went a couple of times doing drum clinic tours. I went to Europe. It was a lot of fun. I guess they've kind of fallen out of favor recently with, with YouTube being so big and people may be feeling like, why would I go to a club? You know? <laughs> yeah. It is sad. Yeah. So, <laughs> so, um, you know, nothing planned right now. I'm open to doing clinics. I'd love to do some. I think it's a lot of fun. There usually ends up being a lot of fun interaction between the, the crowd and whoever's playing. You know, I love to go watch clinics too, by the way. It was one, some of my most formative moments where it was watching other drummers just and how they tackle life and hearing them tell their stories, you know. So it's uh, it's uh, whenever you get a chance to go to something like that, it's, it's highly worth it. But to get back to Megadeth, we will be touring a lot. We're already booking things for 2024. So, yeah. Nice. Very yeah. good. <laughs> so a lot, a lot of when, tours coming up for the new album. <laughs> when will you be coming back to New York City or near New York City? Because I missed you on this run. Ah, man, that I don't know yet. But no I'm work. sure sometime next year, you know, I'm sure sometime next year we'll be we'll be doing another U.S. run of some some shape or form. Awesome. Well, okay. sir, um, thank you very much again for taking time on your day off. Thank you, John, for taking time to, uh, you know, co-host this first uh, live thank interview. You for having me. Thank you for everybody who watched. Uh, thank you for the questions and comments. We will be doing a lot more of these interviews on a monthly or bi-monthly basis coming up soon. We will also be doing roundtable discussions because I can actually drop about nine or ten different people in here at the same time. So Sick Drummer will be doing roundtables where we're because we're tired of the same old questions like we were talking about in the beginning of this before it went live. Hey, how's the tour? You know, um, well, how old were you when you got your first kid? Just the, the, the standard questions that you see everywhere online. And there's nothing wrong with anybody trying to do those to promote you. That's fine. But we want to have a bunch of three or four or five drummers of your stature and other statures on here together interviewing each other. Mm -hmm. And those will become the questions. And I think that will be a lot more beneficial and advantageous, advantageous to people listening instead of just the same thing. So you uh, have just broken the ice, uh, you two, the first drummer ever featured on a cover. And now the first drummer ever featured on a live feature YouTube interview uh, 16 years later. Um, to say I'm humbled is an understatement. So thank you very much. Thank you to everybody who watched. Uh, it will dark send me anything you want added to the description of this for the YouTube, and I will add it in. Safe travels, and congratulations on all your success, man. Congratulations, man. It's been awesome. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thanks to you both, Ian. I just want to say thanks for all your support to the entire drumming community. What you've done is invaluable over the years. We all really appreciate you. John, thanks for being here and for joining us and for you know all the work you've done in music. Super cool questions from both of you. Everybody who tuned in, I really appreciate all of you. You know, love you guys. And uh, yeah, keep following the channel, Sig Drummer Magazine. That's the place where it's at. So thank you all. All right. We will see you guys later. Um, I'm going to just hit end broadcast and we are done. Thanks, Segway. guys.